development um, Thursday uh, the 10th of December. Um, we have a very full agenda this morning and um, what we're going to do is um, we'll have election of chair and appointment of uh, a vice chair uh, just in case um, any difficulties arise. Uh, during the uh, pre-meeting um, it was decided that um, I would chair the meeting today and um, Paul Pavia, Councillor Pavia would uh, be my vice chair and then Paul will uh, deliver um, the uh, outcomes of agenda item number uh, six or seven to uh, to cabinet on um, on Wednesday. Uh, everybody happy with that? Yes. OK, so agenda item number one and number two, um, we have um, uh, resolved. Agenda item number three, uh, do we have any apologies for absence this morning? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from uh, Councillor Roden um, and Councillor Webb, and I believe Councillor Davis, Councillor Evans and Councillor Edwards need to leave a little early. Councillor Dimmock is running slightly late. I think that's it, Chair. Thank you. Is there anybody who needs to leave, um, just uh, jump out of the meeting, that's fine. As long as we have a corridor, and I'm sure officers will let me know um, whether that gets a little bit low uh, where we are with that. Okay, right. Um, and good morning to our officers there. I will I will present um, you as officers um, when we get to each report and I'll just flick through and, and, and bring you in there and just uh, give us an assessment of where we are and, and what the direction is of the report and all of our recommendations there. And, and as, um, as selects, we will uh, look at them recommendations and uh, make some comments uh, known to them recommendations at the final conclusion. OK, so we've got a, agenda item number five is pre-decision scrutiny of the Gypsy Traveller and Show Persons Accommodation Assessment 2021 to 2033. And I think it's uh, Mr Griffiths, Officer Griffiths with us today. Stephen, is that right? Good morning, yes, that's, that's correct, Chair. Chair. Uh, morning, Stephen. Are you all right? I am. Thank you very much. Are there any members. other officers with you uh, accompanying with this this report? Uh, I believe um, Mark Hand is with us, and um, Ian Bakewell, and I think Craig is as well. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. Then anyway, so you bring them in whenever you want, uh, Stephen. This is your report, and the recommendations are it's going to go to cabinet um, at the end of the day. Uh, reference to um, recommendations so do you want to just run us through the report Stephen quickly please and yeah. then uh, we'll let members come in there. Yeah I certainly will. Uh, good morning members and thank you for the invite to present the uh, the current Gypsy and Traveller and show personal accommodation assessment for Monmouthshire. Uh, before I start um, given my overview over it um, I have noticed that the report has omitted an important piece of information and that is that the um, but it is included in the assessment and that is that the the involvement of uh, opinion research services limited. Uh, they're a social research social research organisation working primarily within the public sector, and they assisted us with the, with its preparation. They also, though, uh, assisted uh, because it was part of a wider commission to support other local authorities in the South East Wales, uh, namely Blaine Gwent and Torbine, with their uh, GTAA as well. So I thought I'd better mention that first, and my apologies to OS, OCS. Um, with a bit of the background, uh, as you're probably aware, that uh, under Part 3 of the Housing of Wales Act 2014, uh, all local authorities must undertake a gypsy and traveller accommodation assessment every five years. Uh, this draft GTA is Monmouthshire's third since 2010, and it will run and there is a, there is an, uh, an error in that it will run until 2026 uh, and I'll have to amend that uh, uh, when it will be revisited again. Uh, however, the, the needs of the, fi the, the finding of need has been projected to 2033 and that so it runs concurrently with the replacement local development plan. Um, so that's why I think that's, that there's, a, there's been a bit of an error there. Um, now, the process of undertaking an assessment is really laid down by the uh, by Welsh Government uh, with regard uh, and in a document called Undertaking Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessments, which was published in 2015. And the previous assessment uh, followed those guidelines. 
And what that guideline said was, and this is the process basically I'm just going to run you through, was that we had to promote the fact that we were doing it. So we promoted the fact uh, through what we, we have a, a steering forum um, and it was promoted through the steering forum and, uh, for our forum. And I'll come back to the members of that uh, later. Um, and then it was done with press releases. Uh, it, also, it was highlighted in the Travellers Times so that it tried to get out to as many as many avenues as we could to identify and the reason being is that we wanted to bring forward we wanted gypsy and traveler families and show persons families to come forward um and obviously complete uh and, and partake in the assessment now once that once the promotion uh, of it occurred then we looked then to see how we were going to identify families as well so what avenues we could identify them Mainly that was done through the um, the steering group. And I think, and I haven't got it in front of me, I, I do apologise, but it, within the, the assessment document, it shows the members of that steering group. Now, the difference between now and 2015 was that we did it sort of virtually uh, because of COVID. So it, 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 it didn't formally meet uh, in person then, so to speak. Uh, and base and we use that then through email contact uh, conversations communications to see whether we for those members to bring forward any families from the communities that they you know they could identify um they so that we then could get in contact with them basically uh and then we would write out to them and ask them whether they would want to take the, the, the initial contact would be through the through the agencies themselves to see if we could contact them, contact them, and if they said yes, they were willing, we would contact them then by letter and then a telephone call, and then we'd meet them in person to complete then the questionnaire. Um, so that, that the questionnaire then would be the final bit, in which really then after the identification of the families, which contained the information that which the need was based on. Um, and I think within that, within the assessment, there's there's a rundown then of one of the appendices of the assessment of what the uh, the, the the questionnaire, the question type of questions that were asked. Um, and then from that questionnaire, as I said, we were able to then to determine what the need is for Monmouthshire. Now, when you determine need, um, again, Welsh guide uh, Welsh government within that guidance document suggests that you follow a, a particular. Uh, particular route then for a want of a better word and it looks at certain things it looks at what our current residential supply is uh it looks at what our current res residential demand is and then it looks at on what are that now and that's when you're looking at future demand there are two ways of looking at it uh you can you you can do um Hang on, bear with me. I'm reading off a screen, and I've lost the screen at the moment. Um, so when you look at a future future demand, you're looking at household growth, uh, and you you can use a growth rate. Um, but for our assessment, what we decided, because it was such a small number of families, and we knew the families, we decided to look at growth, not to use a growth rate. Uh, we decided to actually look at the families themselves look at what children they had and the ages of the children and determine then obviously when they came to reach adulthood they would require a pitch and that's how we worked it within Monmouthshire and what that assessment showed us really was that the assessment identified a need for 13 pitches in total to 2033 of that though eight of them would be our immediate need that would need to be met by 2026 uh, and then we had four newly arising needs. That's because children would have grown up then and reached had adulthood by 2023. So the total need for uh, for Monmouthshire is 13 pitches, uh, and that's really the the assessment in a nutshell. Uh, the, the, also, I suppose just to mention what the assessment showed as well that. Um, there wasn't really a need for a, a 
uh, a transit site source stopping pitches within Monmouthshire at the moment. And that's that's basically the what the assessment is showing for Monmouthshire for the Monmouthshire area. OK, thanks, Stephen. Anything else to add to that? No. No, OK. Have you any other options? Uh, unless, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I was going to say unless if, if Mark or Ian or Craig has anything else to add to that. That may have missed. OK, officers, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, Chair, if, if you don't mind, just briefly, um, just to, uh, I guess, give a, a bit of a next steps almost. So um, there's some of the need identified that the needs looking at in the shorter term. Um, so some members will be aware of of the unauthorised sites that are mentioned that have been going through the courts process. Um, and uh, and then longer term, obviously, we've got this identified need and that'll be part of the LDP process. Um, to seek to look for sites um, to include in the LDP where possible um, and also to have a, a suitable policy to allow any future upcoming sites to be considered um, a bit similar to now. In the current LDP, it was concluded at the outset that there wasn't a need that required site provision um, and so it's a slightly different approach to what we need now. We do have an identified need. However, I think as Steve mentions, uh, yeah, The community preference is to um, um, is to have private sites where possible, rather than council-owned sites. But um, it's it's stuff to work through further. Thanks, Jen. All right, thank you. Anything else from officers? Okay, members. Um, do we have any questions to ask um, officers of, of, of the report before us today? Louise, and then I got Lisa. Louise. Hi, Louise. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought I got my camera on. Uh, yeah, I was looking at um, uh, 3.1 uh, where it says about 3.1.2 um, 3, 3 where it says the current need for eight, eight pictures. Um, basically, I wanted to know whether or not those pictures were included within the 13 pictures or not. And um, the second question I've got is, is um, it was mentioned that private sites are the ones that um, uh, tend to be uh, gone for in, in Monmouthshire. But the issue is, is that the Welsh Government have produced very good guidance on um, designing gypsy sites for uh, public sites, but they haven't um, produce particularly detailed guidance on private sites. And I do believe that I would like to ask for a recommendation to include um, gu guidance and policy considerations on private sites on a um, multi-officer um, basis so that you um, develop this policy with um, planning and licensing and so forth because on one of uh, the sites, it's mentioned that you say it's overcrowded, but um, in planning terms, it wasn't seen by the planning officers or planning committee as being overdeveloped. But, um, you know, licensing have different requirements. Now, applicants um, really need clear guidance to know that they might pass um, planning legal hurdles, but they wouldn't necessarily pass licensing hurdles. And in a sense, if those two could be coordinated, it would save um, both departments a lot of time if the applicant wished to go along that route, whereby their, the plan that they produced would cover both planning and licensing and tick both boxes at the same time. Now, there is actually an overlap between the two because the planning circular on um, gypsy and traveller sites actually says that um, the modern standards um, for uh, caravans should apply. And there's differences between touring caravans in terms of distances and also static caravans and definitions of pictures. And I don't think at the moment we have got a properly developed policy um, to cover these issues and I mean I, I, I'm, I'll be happy to um, 
uh, you know, participate in that to explain that further. But um, since most of our emphasis is going to be on private sites, then I think it's something that we 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 need to do. And also, there is a difference between um, need and want in terms of um, in sites. You know, um, you know, for example, um, you know, any person may want um, to have um, all of their family living with them, but um, we, we don't all have um, the, the facilities or the land to actually, um, uh, you know, build, build accommodation for uh, the rest of the family on one particular site. So I think that, that we need to be, because it seems to me as if officers are giving um, different assessments, because planning might say it's not overdeveloped, you're saying the sites are overcrowded and licensing are coming up with something different. And this shows um, that there's a strong need to have a proper um, policy on the development of private sites. So this this type of thing doesn't arise in, in the future. Thank you. OK, I think there's a double, double, double question there. Um, Mark, you would like to come back in on that or, and Stephen? Yeah, can I, Mark? Can I leave you the the planning ones bits? And if I if I can address there, the thirteen the thirteen pitches does include eight, which I think was the first question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it does include that that eight. Mark, would and you then, mind? Sorry. Mark. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, the the answer to that in a bit more detail from Steve's uh, question is in paragraph three point one point one of of the report. Um, where it summarises what the 13 pitches comprises, um, if that gives some to members. In terms of um, the other the other issues that um, that, that Councillor Brown raised, um, yeah, I mean certainly uh, scope for us to work um, closely with environmental health, housing and planning jointly. Um, however, there is a bit of confusion I think in the question about what overcrowding means. Um, it's talking about um, adults uh, on a pitch who should really have their own their own caravan um, as a place to live rather than being in a wider family caravan so in the same context context of housing it's where we have um, you know older children stuck living at home with their parents because they can't get a home of their own it's not literally saying there's too many people in the caravan um, you know they're kind of piled high uh, it's meaning that they should have their own place to live uh, which could be on the site in their own caravan or could be their own pitch in its entirety. Um, so there is a slight bit of confusion there, I think, in what, what overcrowded means. Um, I can understand why you'd naturally think that you know, literally means too many people for the physical space um, rather than you know people needing their own um, caravan for their own lifestyle, um, if, if that helps. Um, but yeah, wherever we can work closely with environmental health, um, then, then housing and planning will do so. OK, the, the other yeah. question uh, Louise mentioned there was the licensing side of it and the the the, 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 the to and and fro in there and, and, and getting them to join to, together because that's a very valid point there. And then the last one, Louise, was was is, is what you class as a, a mobile home and a caravan because they do come in extra sizes and, and, and all them little things as well. So what about them two last ones as well? OK. Um in, in terms of environmental health and the licensing, it's, you know, it's not my area of professional expertise. So, yeah, we, we can look to work um, closely with them. There's two separate regimes that um, sites have to comply with, you know, planning and, uh, and the licensing side. Um, what we'd normally do is seek to, uh, you know, if we have pre-application advice, we'd get both parties in um, and make sure things are squared off there. Unfortunately, this, in the cases we're talking about, hasn't happened in terms of pre-app advice in quite that way. Um, but yeah, we can look to to work on that further in the future. That's not a problem at all. Um, in terms of pitches, um, the Welsh Government guidance does define, um, you know, what, what a pitch is. The, the easiest way I look at it is um, to think of a, a pitch as a, as a plot for a house. Um, so you'll have, you know, garden space, parking space. Um, there tends to be um, a static home, um, you know, a park home, which is still within the definition of caravan that tends to provide uh, living room type accommodation. There tend to be a utility block, which will be um, probably utility room and, and toilets. Um, culturally, quite often, um, you know, toilet functions and things are, are on clean and not done within the caravan itself. So there's a separate block for that. Um, that's a bit of a generalisation, but that tends to be the case. 
uh, and then touring caravans. So again, a generalization, but quite often um, the very youngest children would be in the main static caravan with the parents um, and then uh, slightly older children who are male would be in one touring caravan, perhaps and females in another. Um, so it is a bit like a house with with bedrooms and you'll have different number of caravans depending on the size of the family in the same way as you know you might have a five bedroom house i might have a three bedroom house um that kind of scenario um but the guidance does suggest you know it's at a minimum a static caravan um perhaps two touring caravans um space to park two vehicles and and a garden area um but they do vary in the same way as uh, you have different houses on different plots um, so we have to look at the family's needs and, and the site and what the site can take. OK. And Louise, would you like to come back in there? Are you yeah, okay I, think, with them I think it would be very helpful if, if there was a sort of a, a, you know, mostly disciplinary team that worked on this uh, private site policy, because then you could actually have a plan that would tick the boxes for both planning and licensing. And, you know, you could also, I mean, it would be up to, and I, I think obviously assistance with plans, you know, through planning aid or something like that would also be very helpful, um, you know, because uh, licensing is quite specific about the requirements on plans, probably uh, a little bit more so than planning. And I think it will be to the applicant's advantage to know that they can cover both both areas as opposed to um, applying for planning and then finding that perhaps the sites don't meet the licensing requirements. And I mean, at the end of the day, there are different legal re regimes, but on the other hand, you know, would it not be better for them to be able to tick um, both boxes on a, on a, on a sort of a, a common sense basis? And that will be up to them. But as long as they were given clear guidance that, um, uh, you know, from the outset that this needs to be a, a, a multi-departmental approach and, you know, to have a, a, a very strong and clear planning policy on this um, for private sites, which they um, prefer. And as I say, there is that overlap in the planning circular between licensing and, and planning, a particular paragraph in that that says um, modern standards on caravans should apply to private sites and that's within um, you know Welsh government guidance on it so I think it could be worked with, within it but obviously explaining to the applicant that um, you know it's up to them whether they want to go along the route that might tick both boxes as opposed to tick one and then perhaps later on not tick the other you know because that's their legal right and you wouldn't want to take away their legal right but I, I just thought the process could be use more smoothly if we did have a proper um, uh, private site policy, which we don't have at the moment. Thank you. OK, thanks. Mark, anybody sure. just like a very valid Do point mind? there, Louise, yeah. Do you mind, Chair, if I just come back really briefly on that? Um, in terms of the joint work, and it's yeah, a really yeah. good idea, something we'll pick up. Um, what we couldn't do, however, is have a policy. Um, so what we can do is work with the applicants you know, jointly with environmental health to make sure what they're proposing meets all the criteria. Um, but they are, as, as Councillor Brown mentioned, separate regulatory systems. So we couldn't refuse planning permission because it doesn't comply with environmental health license and vice versa. Um, they are separate consents. So we can try and lead people along to a, a scheme that works for both. But ultimately, um, if they demand that their applications determined, then planning couldn't refuse it because of EH. Um, issues and vice versa. Um, so in that sense, we could never have a planning policy that requires it to comply with other legislation. That wouldn't be uh, legally permissible. But in terms of our working practices, what Councillor Brown suggested in trying to get them um, all aligned before that stage, then yeah, that's something we'll, we'll look to do. Right, uh, Stephen, have you anything else you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, no chair. Okay. All right, uh, any, any more members got any more questions? Me, Lisa. Um, Lisa, I've got no. Where's your hand gone? Okay, yeah, I did see a hand, but he's gone again. Lisa, yes, Lisa, come on in. Yep. Hi, Lisa.
Hello. Hi, we, we, you're in and out, Lisa. OK, do you want to put your question? Sorry, to the office? I just had the blue screen of death, so I'm connecting on my phone. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm late, Chair. I've had a few problems with work. I just want to understand how likely is the demand, is it that the demand will change, especially those that do continue to travel from site to site? Like how, how, um, what's the best way of putting this? Uh, how often do they usually stay long term to a site? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We can um, hear you. I mean, this the 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 current um, or the, the the draft GTA as it is at the moment is valid until twenty twenty six, so it will be revisited again. So if anyone has moved out the county and um, by by that time, then then um, that will be reflected then in in new in new need from twenty twenty six onwards. Okay, so we wouldn't really have an idea till then. I. Um, no, I, 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 no, I don't know. I, I couldn't. I don't know if I can answer that. No, not that I don't okay. know. I. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Any more questions? Any Val, Val Smith, uh, Councillor Smith. Um. <coughs> I'm here as an observer, Chairman, just to ask: Is legislation in Wales the same as that in England? Because I understood that legislation was changing in England. And the imp there's no mention I could see in the report of that possibly impacting on Welsh uh, legislation. So thank you, Chairman. No problem. Uh, anybody like to mark? Yeah, um, the legislation is now in, uh, in Wales to England. It's changed in England um, quite controversially to essentially say that people who have stopped travelling are no longer considered to be travellers. Um, there's no sign of that changing in Wales, and uh, I know in England that's going through now um, a, a court of appeal process um, from from traveller groups saying that that's uh, uh, breaching their their human rights. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they don't win, um, to be perfectly honest. But that's just my uh, my background opinion. Um, in Wales, there's no indication that it's going to change in that direction. Um, the policies, you know, are, are are remaining for all intents and purposes that we can see. Um, so yeah, I don't think anything will change here. Um, I guess the only thing that that might happen is you know we are a border county, so um, families could move across from England um, into uh, into our county, and we'd need to see whether we have a, a duty to accommodate and go through that process. Then, which kind of links back to Councillor Dimmock's question. Um, it is a bit of a fixed point in time, you know, the survey, but it is looking at the families that are here. Um, it tries to predict how they might grow, um, which is quite a difficult question if someone said to you. How big is your family going to be in 10 years time? Um, it's a bit of a finger in the air for most of us. Um, but yeah, it's, it follows the process and it's, it's the best uh, evidence that we have at the moment. OK, thanks for that. OK, Val, um, we've got the answer there. I think probably we'll find um, if things do progress in, in England, um, maybe the Welsh government may uh, look at that and um, decide what they, which avenue they want to go down. Right, both, uh, Stephen and Mark, thanks very much. Uh, as members, uh, the recommendations are um, the Cabinet uh, adopt the Gypsy Travel and Short Persons Accommodation Assessment 2021-23. Uh, uh, Louise made some very valid points in there. I know you want to come back in, Louise. Um, um, Louise, would you like to come back in? Um, yeah, I think um, uh, it would be helpful if, if there was um, some uh, private site um, uh, policy and, and guidance. I mean, that's what, what I would like to see because um, you know, in a sense, um, you know, explaining to the applicant that there's two di different legal systems and the planning side and, and the licensing side. And, you know, you can do these easy read guides, but also um, that there's some, um, uh, you know, um, a better uh, coordinated officer, um, uh, you know, coming together on these 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 sort of things as well. I think you could probably do that by having um, both um, perhaps uh, internal and external uh, guidance on it. I don't know, or you know, s some method of um, practice on it. Because there's a, there's an awful lot of guidance on um, uh, council sites, but there is actually 
um, a lack of guidance on private sites and it may be something that the committee may want to um, you know point out to the um, Welsh Government you know the lack of, of guidance on this particular issue and uh, so, so I think I would like to see some sort of recommendation on that I mean um, perhaps um, uh, Stephen or Mark can come up with something, some particular wording on that. But I think I think we need to have more more concentration on um, uh, private site uh, guidance. Thank you. Okay, both. Is there anything you'd like to comment on that before we conclude on the recommendations? It's a valid point, and perhaps more work to be to be had on looking at um, uh, private sites. Mark. Um, yeah. Thanks, Chair. I mean, it sounds like. Um, well, I haven't heard any dissenting voices. So if, if committee um, wants to recommend um, sort of that multidisciplinary work and approach of planning environmental health and housing, absolutely no objection from me to that. We can do that you know, when when we're uh, serving customers with their inquiries. Um, we could look at guidance to surround that, um, but it would be guidance, not policy. OK. Yeah, we are. Val, you've still got your hand up. You don't want to come back in, do you, Val? No. Thank you. Right. right, members, are we OK with that, members, to take that forward on the recommendations? Uh, Val, you've put your hand back up again. And David, Val? No, I haven't any requirement to speak, Chairman, but my screen is covered by David Dovey's various things, so perhaps it's a crossover. I don't oh. wish to speak. Thank you. All right, thanks, Val. David? OK, David. OK, um, I don't know where David's gone. I've uh, got Roger. Roger. Chair, can Democratic Services do something uh, to help David get rid of what's on the uh, screen? It's totally uh, uh, distracting and, uh, and, and, and spoiling uh, our enjoyment. Let's put it that way. So uh, if Democratic Services, a word with uh, David to uh, let him turn off his camera, I'd be uh, delighted if that could happen. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask somebody, uh, Hazel can uh, get hold of them to Chair, give them a call. They're on, the case. they're on the case. They're on the case. Right, Hazel, can we draw something up then to put uh, before the recommendations for the report with Cabinet? Who is the Cabinet member for um, this report? Is it, is it uh, Jane? Councillor Pratt. I think it would be uh, Councillor Jones, Sarah Jones, in terms of housing. It's not cross-cutting or anything, is it not? No, it's not too. Uh, well, part of the reason we'll be taking it to cabinet um, rather than individual cabinet member chair is because it is cross-cutting in, in that sense. So it also links in with Councillor Greenland's um, planning portfolio, um, but primarily it's, it's, a, it's a housing issue. OK. All right, thanks, Mark. So we'll, we'll draft something up there, Louise and members. Is that OK? And um, we'll get that back uh, on, on the lines of what we discussed today. Yes, everybody Thank happy you. with that? Thank you. I've still got David's hand up there, so I'll take an notice of that now. And, and I, I apologise, David, if you want to come in and you can't get in. Um, we are where we are. Right, let's move on to agenda item number uh, six. Um, just bear with me, let me flick through the screen here. <laughs> there we go. Um, local housing market assessment agenda item number six. Um, uh, the recommendation is to provide scrutiny of the local housing market assessment and to recommend that Cabinet adopts local housing market assessment um, in its meeting on December 16, 2020. Right, members. Um, what officers do we have today uh, reference to this report? Um, I do have um, Louise Corbett. Is she on board with us today? I uh, think she is, Chair. Yeah. Be uh, myself, Ian Bakewell and Louise. I think Louise is on the call. If not, we'll pass over to Ian. 
OK, I've got Louisa's contact details as report off. So you've got yourself, Ian, and then Mark. OK, Be between three of you, then, do you, do you want to run through this report for us members? And then we'll uh, come into questions. Who, who wants to make a start, Ian, Mark or Louise? Mark? OK, I can uh, make a quick start. Is Ian on the call? Or Louise? Let me just check. Let me go through my attendees. If I make a quick start, Chair, while yeah, you're looking. Start. Um, you make a start and so I'll have a quick look. In terms of the report, um, it's the local housing market assessment. So we're looking at um, the affordable housing need for the county um, going forwards for the next five year period. Um, and this is an important point of evidence for both the housing service um, and for the local development plan. Um, the last uh, the last one went through cabinet um, probably only about uh, 18 months ago, um, but we do need to review it every two years. Uh, and in the previous version, we did uh, discover a couple of errors uh, in the calculation. Um, and in addition, the need that's identified now has, has been uh, fairly significantly changed from our, our recent experience with hidden homelessness coming forward um, during the COVID period. So um, the, the end result of, of the document, it goes through all kinds of different sources of evidence uh, and information about um, affordable housing needs. It looks at housing prices on average across the county, salaries, um, and some some really excellent data. Um, that's quite a rich source of information, and it tells us what really none of us will be that surprised to know is a very very significant affordable housing need in the county. Um, in terms of the needs um, within bands one to four, so that's the group that we define as being within housing needs. And um, there is also a fifth band um, who are really seeking sort of an upgrade or a relocation. But bands one to four, which is the uh, the housing needs. Um, the, uh, the need is 2,435 households on that list. Um, so that's households, not individuals. So it's uh, a, a pretty scary number, really. There's then a process of going through that to, um, to look at um, annual turnover of existing stock, newly arising needs, um, various different factors, um, and you uh, come up with a calculation of what the need is across the next five years. And that that need across the next five years comes to 468 um, affordable homes per annum. So that's a very similar figure actually to the last one, but members will, will realise that's uh, a lot more affordable housing than is being built. Um, it's more than the total number of, of homes being built, let alone uh, affordable homes. Um, but it is worth mentioning this isn't a target for, uh, for the old EP. It's, it's just an assessment of need. The planning process is a really important part of bringing forward affordable housing, but it's not the only route. So of the 468 homes per annum that this is showing that we need over the next five years, um, there's a significant proportion of that 68% is social rent. And this is where it really um, differs from the previous LHMA. Um, so 68% social rent, 7% um, intermediate rent and 25% low cost home ownership. Um, I just reflect back that when we're talking about affordable housing we're talking about the TAN2 Welsh Government definition and um, which is different to how it's defined in England there's far broader definition in England uh, with things you know kind of uh, discounted house purchase um, might be described as affordable in England we don't take that view here um, it's very strict criteria set out um, so that is the need that's identified um, there's a really good section in the report that sets out um, a bit of a, a bathtub analogy um, so the water in the bath already is, is existing demand um, and then you've got the taps filling it up with newly arising need um, and whatever's coming out of the plug hole is, uh, is, is what we're actually delivering. So uh, either through new builds or when existing affordable homes become empty and are, and are, and are, and are re, uh, reoccupied. Uh, and then there's other aspects as well. So the Monmouthshire letting service, for example, is an important way that we're trying to top up um, private rented accommodation, but at a at a rent level that's affordable. So it'd be absolutely no surprise to members, you know, we have a, a massive challenge with house prices um, because of COVID and the relative lack of actual sale completions. The data in this version 
is based on both um, actual sales achieved and valuations. So there's a, a margin of error, if you like, in terms of the valuations. Um, you know, there's not guaranteed that people will get what the house is on the market for. Uh, and the evidence is showing that it's really high in Montmorency, but it has dropped slightly. So I think at the moment people are tending to get about 93% of asking price, um, which on a national picture is really high. But there is an element of, uh, of uncertainty. It's giving uh, this based on sales and valuations an average house price of around about £327,000. Um, looking at the figures a different way just on sales, but over a, a, a six month period, um, the figures near uh, um, Nearer the two hundred ninety-seven thousand, three hundred thousand pound mark. Um, so either way, it's it's a massive challenge. Using the first figure, um, the three hundred twenty-six thousand, it works out as a, a one to seven point two three ratio um, of average house price to average income. Or if somebody's on a lower quartile income, um, it's a it's a sales um, a house price to income average of of one to nine ratio. Um, so if you're thinking in the context of um, a mortgage being roughly three, three and a half times your salary. Um, that that really is a, a scary picture. Um, but as I mentioned, and I, and I don't mean to say it kind of passively, it won't be one of surprise to members, but I know it's one of concern to members and, and to officers as well. So there the uh, the highlights, the recommendation to um, to scrutiny committee um, is, is to provide scrutiny of the report and uh, and then it will go on to cabinet. Uh, on the 16th of December um, for approval and then submission to um, to, uh, to Welsh Government. And as I mentioned, it forms an important part of the evidence for, for other policy work, including the, the local development plan. Chair, I've seen that Ian's joined the meeting, um, so I'll pass over to him if he wants to, to add anything to, the, uh, to what I've said. Otherwise, happy to take questions from members. OK, Ian, have you anything? David, don't they? Um, no, I've got, I've got nothing to add at this point, no. All right, thank okay. you, Ian. Uh, right, members, have we any questions, members? Raise your hand. Right, I've got Tony. Tony? Um, Tony's a, an outside member of the committee. Um, so, Tony, do you want to come in and then I've got Louise? Okay, okay Tony. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I speak up for disabled people who are um, disproportionately represented amongst people who want social housing and I've also been a member of Housing Associations Millen and Monmouthshire Housing for the last 20 years but I'm not on the board of any at the moment. Um, the Welsh Government have said that the mix between social and mass market housing should be something like 45% to 55%. Stats Wales say the mix should be 47% to 53%. In the last five years, Monmouthshire has achieved 18, 18% to 82%. Now, in the paper, it says that we need to spend, we need to build 467 affordable houses each year. If, if you adopt the 18 to 82 percentage, that means you've also got to build 2,128 mass market houses in that same period of time. So that's a total build of 2,595 houses. So my question is. How is that achievable and what impetus is there to increase the proportions of social housing against mass market housing? Many of disabled people um, cannot um, have private rents because their properties require adaptations and the private rental market will not adapt properties because there's a question of who will then move into the property when the, the lease becomes available subsequently. My second point, relates to the housing allocation policy and its discord with the current report. In the housing allocation policy, it was said that if you have savings exceeding 16, that's one six thousand pounds, you'll be put into band four, which effectively means that you will never get social housing. But in this report, it says that um, you need at least a deposit of 30,000 and an income of 48 and a half thousand to be able to afford an entry level property. Those two facts are completely at odds with each other because there's an enormous great number of people who do not have an income of 48 and a half thousand or are able to put 30,000 pounds down 
but um, have savings exceeding 16,000. So my question is, well, did the two departments work together on this? And uh, so that's my point. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll bring the other members in and then we can answer all the questions at the end. I think that'd be fair on you officers as well. Um, so I've got Louise. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think my question is, is, is that um, obviously the affordable housing need mentions um, 467 per annum, but the report actually um, doesn't, um, I did realise looking again at the report that it doesn't actually say the number that, that is expected in the LDP because um, obviously the previous number was 400, sorry, 960 um, affordable housing and obviously the, the other point I would like to make about this report is, is that um, I appreciate that there are some single people who are looking for housing and looking for um, uh, social housing, but also I think that um, the, the, it's based on, on a, a single person and their income. Now, um, always, in, certainly in the whole of my lifetime, it's, it's been normal, pra normal practice that, um, you know, friends purchase properties together or, or for example, um, you, you know, couples do, and, and it's based on joint income. You know, so that would actually cut down the ratio significantly. Um, there's nothing in the report about um, the demand for the particular um, bedroom size of dwellings, because obviously, you know, we've got a, a, a one bedroom uh, demand um, at the moment with regard to young homeless people and, uh, you know, possibly a two bedroom demand for um elderly people wanting um flats or bungalows to downsize but have accommodation for visitors possibly three bedroom properties for um young couples who um are th thinking of having a family so i don't think there's any um you, you know sort of um coordination here between the the, the different types of needs, the different types of bedroom sizes that, that are, are needed and, um, you know, the type of dwellings as well. And um, I was very surprised to see that um, in terms of the um, average house prices, it, it put Monmouth, then Chepstow, then Ab Abergavenny, and I would have put them probably um, possibly in a, the uh, reverse order in terms of um, house uh, prices. So I'm not quite clear what the result of this will be in relation to the LDP. And obviously, um, in terms of the 467 throughout the last plan, I think there was only about 400 um, built per annum. And uh, so I'm not sure where this report is is going in terms of um, LDP consideration and you know not only the figures that are used on the basis of sole income but also the um, fact that um, you, you know the house values don't seem to be quite right from my local knowledge of things and um, uh, the ratios are single people rather than um, more than one person and um, you know, I just don't think these, and I think the point that Tony has made is is that there's a gap there between um, the people who um, basically have got some savings but can't afford uh, to buy either. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I've got Martin, Martin Grucott. Martin. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I liked Mark Han's uh, analogy of of the bath uh, and the house we've bought we, we've built uh, representing the water coming out of the plug hole at the bottom. Um, uh, all I could add is is the pipe must be virtually blocked at the moment. Uh, and um, Ian Bakewell brings report after report. Uh, and 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 is doing a great job, but basically lacks the resources to do what I know he as as a bloke wants to do, uh, and I feel very sorry for Ian having to constantly come to committee with these reports. 
as well as being on adult select i'm also a member of children and young people select committee and at our last meeting um, ian bought a report that showed that we had in in monmouthshire some homeless young people who had spent their life in care and then enter adulthood homeless now this is a disgrace chair in in a modern democracy it is an abject failure and and we must address that as a matter of urgency we are simply not building enough affordable or social housing uh, and there has been a clear way proposed for doing this um, a couple of years ago now, I think it was, the, the leader of the Labour group proposed it at County Council. Uh, there is a way in which this county can start to build its own houses again. Now, I know a report is going to this week's cabinet, uh, and I would hope that at the end of this debate, we can send forward a message from this joint committee to ask cabinet to start that process of building our own housing because to put it frankly the private sector have failed miserably as tony crowhurst pointed out we are failing to address the needs of people who very often are in no position to help themselves i think that as elected members we have a duty to try to create an equal opportunity community that's one of the things that we've signed up to. And this is a huge area where we can do that. So um, I, I, I would hope that that is one thing that from this morning's meeting, we can send forward loud and clear to this Wednesday's meeting of the Cabinet, where they will discuss the idea of the County Council setting up some form of, cell, uh, of building once more. Thank you, Chair. OK, uh, thanks for that, uh, Martin. And um, I, I know Bob's on online with us this morning. Bob, have you any comments you'd like to make with um, the members uh, questions and observations they've had in into this report? Bob? Bob, for the uh, record, is the cabinet member. I think he's responsible for um, yeah. this report. Bob? Yeah, sorry, Chair, I am here. Um, yeah. I couldn't get my camera to come on, but then you, okay. you're saved. Oh, you're, saved oh, you're, you're saved that anyway. So, uh, yeah, yeah Chairman, uh, I would just like to to make uh, some comments, particularly in in relation to building our own houses, uh, and of course that is that is something that we wish to do. However, we can only do that once we have the um, uh, the LDP in position, because at the moment. We have in the existing LDP, um, all our houses really are coming on stream. They will be built. Uh, and so we have to wait for a, um, a new LDP to increase our delivery of social housing. And then is the time to bring forward a development company. There's no point in bringing forward a development company now which has no houses to build. But most certainly when we have the LDP in position, uh, we, we will be doing that. But the, um, the existing LDP already has um, uh, social housing in there and it will be delivered through the normal systems of delivery for the rest of this LDP. Thanks, Bob. I've got Roger. Martin, you've still got your hand up there. Uh, Roger wants to come back. Uh, what Roger wants to come in. Roger. Thank you, uh, Chair. It's good to hear what uh, Bob has just um, said there, and uh, I hope it's made plain in the uh, cabinet meeting uh, next week. Um, uh, the, uh, the the criteria that he's just um, mentioned. Uh, and what we must do in the uh, the uh, forthcoming LDP is to screw down the uh, developers who, as I said in the uh, pre-meeting, are very happy to go along. Yes, we'll uh, do the 35% affordable housing or 25% affordable housing, depending on what part of the county it's in. And then when it comes to the uh, crunch, 
they go crying to the district valuer saying, oh, there's all these things that we never thought about um, beforehand that makes it absolutely uneconomical that we can build anywhere near the amount of affordable housing that you want. Um, we've overcome that to a certain extent uh, in that when we didn't have the um, uh, four year or five year, I can't remember what it is, uh, uh, amount of um, uh, land for the developers, we came up with a, a solution of we can have exception sites provided without any question you build 35% affordable housing. And that has been uh, taken up. No ifs, no buts, 35% uh, affordable housing. So they can do it. Um, and we must make sure that they uh, do do it in the replacement LDP. And uh, uh, if we can have it in, uh, in writing, so to speak, that we are considering um, getting our own uh, uh, company to, uh, to build houses, um, and I, I, going back to what Tony said, uh, the um, uh, social landlords um, actually uh, build houses and, and maintain them. But I think the important thing is if we build our own, we're obviously going to have rents coming in. And it's important that those rents are after expenses put on one side. So if we build our own uh, um, social housing, we can afford to uh, to maintain them. Anyway, I hope we go down that line. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thanks, Roger. Right, let's go back to Tony and Louise's uh, questions there. Can we, Mark or, or um, Ian, can we start with um, Tony's uh, questions there and just um, round them off and then Louise's questions, please? Yeah, certainly, Chair. Um, I think I'll do a bit of a double act with, um, with Ian, if that's OK. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the calculations are kind of extrapolating it out. Um, so, Tony mentioned a figure of you know over two thousand a year, um, potentially, um, and and questioned is you know how would that be delivered? The answer is it's not deliverable. Um, Monmouthshire has never, and I cannot see it ever delivering that many homes in total per annum. I can't see that being acceptable to members in terms of level of growth um, or or sustainable. It just takes it too far. Um, so it does come back to the point I made that it's you know it's an area of need, but it isn't and largely for that reason isn't anywhere you know in, in wales used as an ldp target but it is an important part of the evidence and we'll talk about that in a few minutes in the next report in terms of how that's informed uh, you know, our as officers preferred growth option for the county but we'll come to that in the next item um so it does it does pose a, a very real problem because as, as tony says you know you add up the figures and what's what's coming out the plug hole to use uh, councillor groundcott's uh, comments um i i I wouldn't say the pipe's blocked, but we could do with a, a larger plug hole, uh, a much larger plug hole. Um, so, uh, so yeah, they, they are very real challenges and, you know, members absolutely uh, understand that. Uh, and it's really encouraging to know that there is cross party support, um, you know, across all of the groups for affordable housing delivery, because um, it is so important in our county. Um, in terms of the, uh, the other kind of um, directions of travel with policy that Tony mentioned, so yeah, the National Development Framework or, or Future Wales 2014, as it's being rebadged, is talking about uh, for the first five years of its life, um, a need for 47% of homes built to be affordable. Um, it also talks about that growth being largely directed to Newport and the Valleys. Um, and that provides its own conundrum because those sites are less viable than in Monmouthshire. You know, we would struggle and have struggled to get anywhere near 47%. Uh, under current policy approach um, for those areas um, it's, it's going to be impossible without some pretty hefty public subsidy so I imagine there'll be a separate Welsh Government policy approach following that route um, with, with public subsidy put into it. I can't see any other way of achieving anywhere near that. Um, what the Welsh Government does um, and the Minister does promote is inclusion of affordable housing led sites in development plans um, and again, I won't talk about that now because that's in the next item, but that is something that we're, we're promoting um, as part of our uh, proposed solution. But yeah, the, the hard fact is the level of affordable housing we're talking about is well below what the LA, LHMA says. In terms of Tony's second question around um, the alignment of the housing allocations policy and the LHMA, 
I'll pass to Ian on for that on the detail. But in terms of our departments talking to each other, um, then firstly, yes, and um, we're working very closely together. And secondly, you know, both policies are written by the same department anyway. Um, but housing, planning, um, all those related services, um, which which currently sit with me, are all uh, are all working very closely together to get that to align. Um, but if I pass to Ian for the detail on that, and then I'll come back on the the other questions if that's okay, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. Um, yeah, the um, yeah the the query that I'm understanding that you're uh, raising, Tony, again uh, is around the sufficient financial resources relating to the uh, allocation policy, um, uh, and the committee or the adult select committee received the uh, the policy change uh, a few months ago. And uh, I mean, Tony, Tony's right that uh, certainly uh, there was a need to review the financial resources section on the on on the policy. So we, so remembering that the policy is is a is is works on the basis of uh, targeting those in the greatest need. Um, there's a section in the policy that relates to having sufficient financial resources and therefore arguably uh, don't need social housing um, or there's a, uh, there's a lower need for social housing in the event of either having a level of savings or a level of income. So we, we made a number of changes on that section. We, we increased uh, the amount of savings to 16k, which uh, Tony just quoted. Uh, we increased the uh, the income threshold to 45,000 um, pounds, and we increased the, the banding around that. So, so previously, under the old policy, uh, you'd have been in band five, but under the new policy, you'll be in band four. We also um, we also uh, built in a caveat that anyone that is on, we, would, we wouldn't count benefit income. Uh, and we, we also discounted, say like if somebody got a payment, so, so like leaving the, leaving the forces, um, we would discount uh, that, that sort of lump sum. So, and the, and the figures that we came to were based on average property prices in Monmouthshire. So these weren't arbitrary figures that were picked out of the, the air. And, and then another important consideration is that we're not necessarily talking about always buying your own property. Um, you know, it's also about accessing the private rented sector as well. So, so, we, so we, we made that change, um, which, which we, we consulted upon um, and uh, uh, you know again that that will be subject to review over over time uh, again so um, you know that's the thing it's, it's only been in place uh, relatively recently so um, you know we, we can you know we can amend that and review that as we're going along. Okay thanks Ian. Um, anything else there on Louise's question? Uh, Louise? Yeah, in terms of the other questions raised, so um, so Councillor Brown was uh, talking about the type of housing, the level of level of housing. So, um, yeah, the the local housing market assessment doesn't specify um, the level of affordable housing needed in the LDP. They're two separate documents, um, but it does form you know part of the evidence base. So clearly, the LHMA is showing that we need 468 affordable homes per annum to uh, over the next five years to to tackle the the need that's identified. A chunk of that comes from the planning process. Um, some comes from other things like um, Monmouthshire letting service um, and the like, and also sort of the annual churn of uh, of existing affordable homes as people uh, move out and, and others move in. Um, but that 468, um, you know, is part of the the information that we use for for the LDP, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes under the, the next report. Um, in terms of um, bedroom size, um, there's a lot of information in the actual LHMA itself, not in the covering report, but the LHMA itself, um, pages 14 to 18 in particular, 
um, looks at the different bedroom size requirements, um, demands, identifies some other challenges for us as well. So in terms of getting on the housing market, typically, you know, a starter home would be um, flats or a terrace. Um, we were looking through the data before, but the average price of our, um, our flats is higher than the average price of all property types in Blyna Gwent. And the average price of a terrace property in Monmouthshire is higher than the average price of all property types in Torvine and Newport. Um, so just getting on that ladder um, in Monmouthshire um, is, is harder than in neighbouring authorities. And again, that won't be a surprise to any of you. That's one of the things that we've talked about and members are really concerned about and officers too um, going forwards. Um, the bedroom size issue is really important in terms of thinking about what we build going forwards. Um, so uh, with developments at the moment, um, the affordable proportion, um, so Louise will know exactly where a development's proposed and what the need is in that area. And we can pin that right down and say, you know, we want three two bedroom bungalows, four um, one bedroom apartments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we are proposing, uh, we'd like to include in the LDP, going on slightly to the, to the next report, is a policy around housing mix for the market sector. Um, and that's one to be discussed um, throughout the LDP process. But at the moment, um, we control the affordable housing elements. The market's left to its own devices for the latter. As a rule, um, they'll build what will sell. In Monmouthshire, anything will sell. So they would naturally migrate towards the larger kind of four bed detached type properties because there's a higher profit margin. You know, it's, it's natural economic sense for them. Um, we're, we're working towards the argument we need a bit of intervention in that to ensure we can get some smaller market homes built. Um, otherwise, we have a gap between people who qualify for affordable housing and people who just can't get on the ladder because the only thing on the market in Monmouthshire is a four bed detached, you know, and there's there's no sort of two bed or, or very few two bed or three beds um, or even smaller apartments uh, uh, in the mix. So that's something we'd like to look at through the um, the, the LDP process with policies later. Um, in terms of um, income ratios, Councillor Brown's absolutely right. You know, we do talk about um, income to house price, you know, assuming it's a single salary purchase. Um, but even if you assume there's two people in the household, you know, both earning and, you know, not thinking about one going part time or something with future child, child uh, uh, bearing uh, opportunities. Um, so assuming it's, it's two, uh, two average incomes, the house prices are still in excess of three, three and a half times um, joint income. Um, so we still have that that challenge. You know, people on decent incomes um, jointly as a household would still struggle to get a mortgage for £300,000 starting and to get the deposit, you know, when you haven't got that equity. Um, and also the added challenge with private sector rents being quite high. So assuming they're private renting at the moment, just living day to day and building up a deposit is a challenge. If they're with mum and dad or the bank of mum and dad exists, that's a, you know, a helpful stepping stone. Um, but, you know, it's still a, a real challenge for people. Um, the house prices, Councillor Brown commented on saying it wasn't quite perhaps her uh, reflections on on how they looked. I mean, all I can say is that's based on the evidence from um, that's actually out there on sales and valuations. Um, it, you know, it isn't our opinion. It's, it's just the evidence of what's out there. Um, do you want me to move on to other questions, Chair? So Councillor Graucourt asked a couple. Yes, Chair. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Councillor Graucourt, um, I mentioned about the, the pipe being blocked. I think it's more maybe we need a, a bigger drain. Um, in terms of the development company, um, this isn't my remit, so I won't stray on it too much. But as, as Councillor Gra um, as Councillor Green mentioned, um, it's really looking at having this set up for the future when there's the land supply there and projects for it to move on. But the report going to Cabinet is suggesting a, a way of starting it up with a, with a potential scheme in Caldecott. Um, so that I'm not sure if it's going through scrutiny in its own right, that report, but um, you'll be able to see the Cabinet report and the proposal that's there in terms of building it up. Um, what I would say is that the challenge we're finding um, and in our discussions with registered social landlords oh is they would all build more. Um, if there were more land available, you know, that's what the RSLs are telling us. They'd do far more and be, be more involved if the land were available for them to build on. Um, so that really then comes on to the LDP and what we put on there. Um, 
and how we balance that level of growth with sustainability and infrastructure and everything. Um, and then last but not least, I must apologise, I wrote down Councillor Harris's name and was listening to his question, but I didn't actually write down what he was asking. Um, I think he was talking around viability of developments um, and how we need to get that right. Um, and I guess that comes back to Tony's initial question about you know the 47% in national policy suggestion. Um, we do have to make sure these developments are viable um, or they just won't happen. You know, 80% affordable housing on a scheme that isn't viable will mean we get 80% of nothing, which is nothing. Uh, so we do have to make it balanced. Um, we also have to make sure that the communities that result are you know, cohesive and balanced in their own right. Um, we all talk with um, fund affection about the 60s and the huge programme of social house building then. Um, but we do have to sit back and realise we do have some very big solely ex-council estates in sometimes fairly remote locations and some social issues around them. What we're seeking to do now is get more of a balance um, rather than you know, market housing over here and, uh, and social housing over there. Um, so it is important to get that mix right, I believe. Um, and that's what we're seeking to do. Um, and we have to make sure it's viable. We also have to bear in mind the infrastructure needs that we have in the county um, and getting all of that balance right as well. Um, so I think that probably covers Councillor Harris's question, but if not, and he wants to come back, then then happy to uh, to correct that. No, thanks. that's fine. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks. I got Tony just wants to come back in. Tony, just a quick one, please. Yeah, I would, I would put... I would point out there's a big void between the highest amount of money you can have for social housing as, as regarding the housing allocation policy and the lowest amount of, how, of money you must have to, in, to have an entry level property from the mass market. There's an enormous great void there that needs filling. The other point I'd like to make is that the mass market does not think about disabled people enough. I recently surveyed the biggest state that's being built in Griffiths Town to find that there was at least 17 or 18 different things that the mass market was not doing that would have made the estate more acceptable for disabled people. From the lack of a bus service for seven years, from the lack of drop curbs, from steps being installed at front entrances just for aesthetic purposes. There were 17 different things that made a, a, a development unacceptable for dis disabled people. Now, I know that it's, it's a building control thing, or it might be a planning thing, but nowhere have I seen anything mentioned about the needs of disabled people within the, the, the debate this morning. So I'd just like to put a marker down that the mass market does not it, essentially make properties and, and the environment around the properties suitable for disabled people. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. OK, I think the officer's got the point there and, and Ian, the discrepancy between the, um, the the need of, of the financial side of it as well. They say we, we had that a few months ago and it has been uh, amended um, and we still need to investigate that, Ian, uh, on the basis of his, um, the massive gap between between the two. Uh, I got nobody else would like to speak there. Tony, you still got your hand up. Bob, I'll allow you to come back in, Bob. That's fine, no problem. Yeah, thank you. And um, <laughs> thanks for Mark for reminding me because I was just madly trying to think where the um, where we'd got with the update on proposals to create a development company because I knew it was in the pipeline, but I didn't realise it was actually coming up for um, discussion next um, next week. But what I can simply read to you the recommendations that are going to cabinet next week, and it is this that cabinet agrees to the proposals to commence a project to undertake the construction of low-cost homes on the site adjacent to Caldecott Comprehensive School in Caldecott. Um, and then the second one, which is the one I was referring to, that cabinet agrees to the continuation of the planning for the development company so that it can be implemented when opportunities or a land supply pipeline are secured and the requirement for a development company is both justified and required by law. So in other words, we are very, it is something which has been discussed uh, by cabinet colleagues informally for, for some time uh, but I wasn't aware until I Mark reminded me that it was actually coming onto the agenda for cabinet next week so I hope that that um, answers both Councillor Grocott and Councillor Harris's questions. Okay thanks for that Bob. 
May, may I just ask somebody, um, just a quick question is, why do you think we are failing on exception sites? Why it's becoming too difficult on exception sites, Mark um, or Bob? Yeah, I, I think there's probably two, um, two aspects to that. I, I, I'm second guessing your question, but there's, there's a policy that allows for rural exception sites. So we could build 100% affordable housing on the edge of villages. Um, and potentially grant fund aspects of those. Um, they're few and far coming forwards, largely around viability. Um, that's not unique to Monmouthshire by any extent, um, but we tried to address that to an extent by this LDP having what we call the 60-40 sites, which 60% affordable housing, 40% markets. Um, that's been a mixed success. Um, so some have worked and have happened and are in the pipeline. Um, some haven't worked. Um, and there's a mix of issues around those, for example, you know, on the smallest sites, it only takes a small bit of infrastructure um, to go wrong for those not to be viable. So, you know, a, a drainage issue and you can't build five houses financed by two market. Um, several others have stalled because being blunt, the landowners have got their eyes on residential value. That's not justified um, and are you know effectively being greedy. The whole point in those sites is to bring forward housing that wouldn't otherwise happen. Um, but I think they've seen that it's got a residential allocation and think it should have full resi value, which which isn't true. Um, we'll, we'll be looking to send out really quite a strong message going forwards in the new LDP because um, any of those sites that haven't happened will be deallocated. They won't go back into the plan unless there's really exceptional circumstances. You know, for example, they've been held up because of Welsh water or something. Um, Otherwise, they just haven't come forward. They'll go back to agricultural land value um, and that will send out a strong message to people going forwards with sites in the plan that they need to use them or, or lose them. Um, I think probably the point that um, Councillor Harris was making was we briefly had a policy in place to look at sites outside of the LDP um, based on the five year housing land supply. Um, and. Uh, and when we did have those sites, we had a couple come in and some more in the pipeline. Um, they were, you know, achieving 35 percent affordable housing that we said was just, uh, you know, offer us this or, or don't bother. Um, those sites didn't have any level of hope value because they weren't in the plan, ironically. Um, but we that that policy has come to an end um, and is, is, you know, just sat there on a shelf at the moment. Uh, because because um, it's very clear message from the Raglan application um, that the Welsh Government supported a, a plan led approach um, and they've since changed national policy. So we don't have a five year housing land supply measured in the same way as we used to. Um, and that emphasis on that has been taken away, um, which there's a there's a logic to and I understand and I follow to an extent, but it does give us quite a worrying gap um, between the current plan, you know, delivering and finishing up that Councillor Greenland mentioned and the new plan sites coming forward in, in 2023. Um, so we have a worrying gap in the middle. Whether or not anything changes during that period remains to be seen. There have been a couple of interesting decisions in Caffili recently. Um, but yeah, I think that's the policy that Councillor Harris was referring to um, and the reasons why we're not doing that at the moment. Um, but I second guessing your question, I think you might have been asking from a slightly different angle. So hopefully that's covered both. OK, thanks, Mark. Right, we'll sum up now on the basis of is the uh, the report going to Cabinet uh, as members. And Hazel will um, sum us up as reference to what we've got uh, to put into um, to our observations from the report um, for next week. Hazel, do you just want to give us a, a quick second on that and see whether we as members are in agreement with um, where we are with um, our observations from today? Hazel? Yes, Chair, we can write a more detailed um, sort of account of some of the questions that were raised um, for you to present Cabinet next week. But I think, you know, you, you've asked a lot of questions today without going back over them. Um, I think there seems to be general support from the committee to move um, forward with the direction of this report. And there seems to be general support for the development of a uh, a development company as and when the time's appropriate and tying into the uh, the LDP. So that that's really the take out for I think for for the summing up for this part of the agenda. 
Is every member happy with that? We, we'll we'll draft something up for you for everyone and, and email it out to uh, the committee members, and then if there's no comments, um, we'll forward that on to uh, the um, to Paul to present to cabinet to be included uh, within their report. Uh, Louise, you've got your hand up, Louise. Yeah, I just wondered if, um, uh, in view of the comment that was um, made about the um, proportion of income and, um, you know, if it's two people rather than one, I think it would be useful if, if it had some comment on that, because if it's two people um, rather than one purchasing, then, um, you know, it's three and a half times. And I think Possibly, I'm not sure what the mortgage companies do at the moment, but that is is actually a bit more feasible. And although, um, you know, there is um, a grim picture painted here in, in terms of the need for affordable housing and the, the current um, market price of housing, um, it is probably higher in this area than in, uh, in comparison with Wales, but it's not really high in comparison with many places in in England, and you know, I do think that um, you know it has always been the case that um, people often have to have to buy jointly, or or they buy um, uh, you know if they're, if they're not in a um, uh, relationship, then they um, buy with with friends. So I, I don't think it's any different in some senses from what it has been for a considerable period and I think uh, obviously an evidence basis has to be um, balanced. Thank you. Okay, yep. Yeah. So if we, if we draw something up and then uh, we'll post it out to members, any comments then um, come back to us and we'll make sure then Paul has um, a, uh, um, a paper to take to um, Cabinet on the 16th uh, next Wednesday. Okay members, happy with that? Yep, yeah. no more hands, no more questions. Right, thank you. Let's move on to agenda item number seven. Just bear with me, I'll get into my screen now again. I'll just flick through it. <clears throat> I think this is one for you, Mark, as well. Um, I'll just get to it and see who the, the author of the report is, Mark. Just bear with me one second, please. There we go. Agenda item number seven is uh, Monmouth's replacement local development plan growth and spatial options. Um, the recommendations are to feed back comments on the RLDP growth and spatial options paper as appropriate prior to officers seeking cabinet's endorsement uh, on the 16th of December, which is next Wednesday, which we know Paul will, um, will take anything from today. Uh, forward. Uh, Mark, you're going to bring this. Have we any other officers which uh, are coming forward? Uh, is this one of yours as well, Bob? Yeah, yeah Chair, it's in uh, Councillor Green. Yes, okay, Bob, I'll, I'll allow you to come in, Bob, as well, if you want, just put your hand up or whatever. Have we any other officers as well, Mark? Yeah, yeah, you'll be pleased to know I was just going to do a very, very quick intro and then pass over to Craig and Rachel um, to present on the, the paper. All right, you carry on, Mark, then. Thank you. OK, yeah, thanks, members. This is, um, as the uh, chair mentioned, to bring forward the LDP growth and spatial options to scrutiny um, for your comments. Um, we're bringing it to Cabinet on the 16th for endorsement to go out to consultation. That'll be between the uh, 4th of Jan and the 1st of February. Um, so I'll, I'll pass over to Craig and, and Rachel now to talk you through the document. The only thing I would mention at the outset um, is Hazel kind of mentioned there were a couple of queries from you um, earlier about the, the amended documents that have come out. Um, so just to touch on those to, to reassure you and, and ask those questions. Um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations um, evaluation have just been updated as we're working through it with, with colleagues with the Equalities Officer and, uh, and Hazel um, Clatworthy. So there's a, a few bits added to that um, in terms of uh, the Resilient Wales section, um, the Poverty section and um, looked after children, um, corporate parents in sections. So there's extra text in there, um, just uh, reviewing you know, how it impacts on those elements. Um, the report itself, the growth and spatial options report itself, um, changes were, were really incredibly minor. So for example, in a couple of places, the report referred to the LDP, and we've amended it to say the replacement LDP, so the RLDP. Um, 
and there was uh, an erroneous reference to a date in there that we corrected. Um, so nothing of substance whatsoever, just very small uh, um, administrative points really. Okay, um, but if you're happy Chair, I'll pass over to, um, to Craig um, and Rachel to take us through the report. Yeah, that'd be great, no problem. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, is it okay if I share my screen? I've got a PowerPoint presentation. It might be easier to show members um, some of the yeah. graphs and some of the information. So yeah. I'll try and do that. Bear with me in terms of technology. Can, um, can you let me know, Chair, when you can see that on your screen? Yeah, I got that on my screen, members. I think we're okay. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think we've got a. Um, yeah. Okay, Craig, you take it away, mate. Okay, I'll just try and make this bigger. Has that? Yeah, that's. There we go. Right. Sorry, it always takes a bit of time just to get the thing set up. Um, right. There we go. I think we're set up my end, so I'll make a start now. So yes, it's uh, hello members. Nice to see you. Well, not to see you all today, but when your cameras go on, nice to see you. Um, myself and Rachel Lewis are going to, um, colleague Rachel is going to run you through the growth and spatial options paper. I'll cover the growth options, and then Rachel will come in later to discuss the spatial options. Um, we've also got a colleague here, uh, Pete. Bowden, he's from Edge Consultants. They've been working on us with regards to the detailed statistical uh, population modeling which sits behind uh, these growth and spatial options. It's quite detailed, so we thought it'd be appropriate that Peter was here to ask any direct questions from members as well. Um, right, so if I run you through the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so first, just a bit of an update on what the replacement local development plan is. Um, it's the plan which covers a period from 2018 to 2033, which will allocate land for development. It will designate areas for protection and it also contain policies um, which we can base all planning application decisions on in the future. It will cover the whole of the county, apart from the part which sits in the Brecon Beacons National Park, which they, they have their own um, planning authority for, for that area. The bottom of this slide just outlines the current um, revised delivery agreements for the replacement local development plan. Members will remember we took a paper to council in October uh, to get agreement of this, this new directory in terms of the dates. So, and members will also remember that we did previously have to go back um, a few steps in terms of the development of the plan, given the impact of the pandemic. Um, in March 2020, we were out on consultation on the preferred strategy for the replacement plan, um, but obviously the pandemic did cause us to retreat and, and, and cancel that consultation given the implications uh, of the uh, pandemic. Since that time, since the, the time when we, we stalled our preferred strategy, there's been a number of different evidence bases which have come out, namely the Welsh Government population projections um, which were the 2018 projections, which updated in the previous 2014. So given that all has happened with the pandemic and given that this new evidence which, which, which um, became available, as outlined in that report in October, we decided that it was the right thing to go back and look at the evidence base to ensure this plan is based on the most robust and update evidence and ensure that we do, do ensure that we have the right level of growth that meets our issues and objectives. Um, so we've gone back to the growth and options um, stage of the, the plan and what this paper is seeking to do, it, which paper is going to cabinet next week, is to go out to consultation on these growth and spatial options in, in January. So just a bit of a reminder on, on what the replacement local development plan is trying to do um, and, and sort of the issues and the, the challenges which are facing Monmouthshire at this period over the 2033. And it's a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today in terms of the other papers we've discussed. So the massive issue with regards to the lack of affordable housing in Monmouthshire is a huge issue um, and one of our, our key issues that we, we want to seek to address as part of this plan. So as you can see here, 2,435 households were on the waiting list in the summer of 2020. Uh, obviously, that is a significant um, number of people who are looking for a home, which is considered to be you know, a, a right, really, to have to have somebody to have a shelter and to have a home, a place to live. Um, 
also shows the Monmouthshire has a high average house prices. So it's 297,000 was the average in March 2020. We have an aging population, um, so, so an absence of people living in living in Monmouthshire in the 20 to 40 year age bracket. So we have that. We don't have a balanced demography at the moment. And, and, that, and that, when we go through the graphs at the moment, you'll see there is an aging population as we go forward. We do have high levels of commuting as well. And um, we have a number of, of, of you know, protected landscapes and heritage assets which we seek to protect. And um, this LDP will, will provide policy frameworks for us to be able to do that. We also have the, the objective to need to tackle climate change and carbon reduction. Um, we all know that the council has signed up for a climate um, emergency. And we need to ensure that when we do build houses, they are the most sustainable houses, energy efficient um, and, and the right type of housing. So we need to address that as well by ensuring we do have enabling policies for renewable energy. And obviously there on the bottom is just opportunities and to ensure that we do have transport connections across the county and, and people aren't isolated in rural areas. And, and, the, and these issues and challenges uh, and objectives of Monmouthshire, so underpinned by robust evidence which have been developed and do tie into the Public Service Board wellbeing plan and also the corporate business plan as well. So there is this sort of holistic, all these pieces of work coming together and this LDP seeks to address those, those issues. So as I said, what, why are we revisiting the growth and spatial options? As I touched upon, um, the updated Welsh Government 2018 base productions uh, published in, in August 2020 provide the starting point for evidence. So we've gone back and used the most up-to-date evidence. Um, and, and it's very much said, said by Welsh Government that this is the starting point. On top of those pu um, population productions, you can add policy interventions to address the things I just mentioned. So to have a level of growth which actually addresses these issues and that's what we seek to do. The updated um, local housing markets, the LHMA, which we were just discussing in, in the previous report, this has now been updated and this is showing that there's a need of 468 affordable homes per annum. And, and it, in, in that slide there, you can see the split there, 68% social rent, 7% intermediate rent and 25% low cost ownership is what's required and what's needed. So this, this key piece of evidence is also um, updating our thoughts on, on what we what we need to address going forward. So we've looked at 14 different growth scenarios which have been modelled by EDGE consultants um, and we've identified six which we'll go out in consultation for um, and we've also um, this time which we didn't do previously we've identified a preferred option so we, we want to go out to consultation outlining like outline to local communities that this is the council's preferred option. This is what we think best addresses the issues and objectives that, we've, that have been highlighted by, by um, this council. So we want to be as open and transparent as people as possible and have that level of engagement discussion as to what people think that the best way we can address these issues is. So in terms of the, in terms of the modeling, in terms of the six models we've looked at, we've added a number of sensitivity testing on top of these. So these, these are three areas um, that we've added on, onto the population um, projections to, to look at how we address these issues. So one is to increase household formation rates. So the 2018 population projections show a projected increase of households comprising four plus adults, indicating young adults are living with their parents in shared accommodation and able to afford their own home. So by increasing the household formation rates, more homes will be built, increasing opportunities for young adults to access housing within the county rather than move elsewhere. So this objective will be supported by affordable housing and private sector housing mixed policies and it'll help address some of those, those key objectives. Another sensitivity testing we put on is, is applying a reduction in the commuting ratio. So the 2011 census indicated that 54% of the working age population commutes out of the county for work. This adjustment reflects the council's economic ambition to attract new employment to the county, meaning few people will need to travel out for work. This approach will support the council's climate emergency declaration, and it will also um, tie into the, into the ways of working that have been found through the pandemic. And, and as we are now, this virtual technology where people, I think, are not going to work the same as they, as they, as they always have previously. And, and the impact of the pandemic has shown that a, a lot of companies can work more robustly and have that. that impact on climate change and also people's well-being in terms of their work-life balance. And the third set of adjusted uh, sensitivity testing we've added is adjusted migration rates. Um, 
So this is to reflect local influences to take into account the removal of the seven bridge tolls. This adjustment reflects known trends. So Monmouthshire's population is aging and declining. So immigration continues to be essential to rebalance Monmouthshire's aging demographic and ensure communities are socially and economically sustainable. These are the six uh, options which um, have been selected for consultation. I will go through these one um, individually at the moment, so there'll be a, a bit more detail, but just as a quick overview. So the first is a balanced migration with household formation rates and community ratio adjusted. Second option is the Welsh Government 2018 Big principle, principle, which is the starting point before adding on any policy choices. Third one is the Welsh Government 2008 based principal projection with the house formation rates and the commuting ratio adjusted. The fourth one is the dwelling led five year average completions, which just is a um, continuation of how we've done over the last five years push forwards. Option five is a demographic led scenario with household formation rates and commuting ratio, um, ratio adjusted. And the sixth option is an employment led radical structural change. Now, given the affordable housing is a key objective um, of this council going forward, and given what we've just discussed as part of the LHMA report and, and members' discussion about the need for affordable housing in Monmouthshire, um, from a planning perspective, we do feel this needs to be a policy-led approach to this and directly address this key issue. Um, it's one of our biggest challenges, and um, it, there are high average house prices in Monmouthshire compared to other counties, in, in, certainly in South East Wales. Um, so we, certainly want to address this. So what we've done is model the growth scenario and which seeks to address that. So we seek to, uh, on top of the normal affordable housing, which we will seek from, from the level of growth outlined in, in the six models, the baseline, we'll also add on a, a policy-led approach to address 10% of the LHMA need. And we seek to do this by adding 50% affordable housing schemes. So 50-50, so 50% open market and 50% affordable housing. Um, so that additional amount of housing will be added on to the baseline. If we just talk through the various different options that are available. So this first option is a balanced migration option. This is a demographic led production which balances in migration and out migration. So any population change is due to natural change. So birth versus deaths. Um, this scenario, however, we have added a policy assumption for increasing household formation rates and a reduced reduction in the commuting ratio in order to influence the retention of the local population. And it also includes the, the affordable housing policy led element. So all of these options, because affordable housing is, is a key target for us, we've added on the affordable housing for each option because it, it is clearly a, a, a policy approach we want to take going forward with this replacement local development plan. So if I talk you through, through these graphs, the graph on the left there is a population change. So that shows you how the uh, population will change for each um, age group up until 2033, what, what, how it will look in 2033 with this scenario. And in on the right there is the table which shows each growth option and shows you the figures for each growth option. So, so to the population change that we'll, we'll, we will see over this 15 year period, the jobs, um, that potentially required to maintain that population, the homes that are required um, for that population, and then the, the fifth column to your right is the homes with the 50% added on. So the fourth column is, is the baseline, the fifth is adding on this 50-50 sites, 50% um, affordable and 50% open market as well. And then the last column, it just shows you the, the, the complete total, the homes per annum with the 50 sites added on. So as you can see from this first option, it would reduce the population by approximately 5,000 people. We do have an aging demographic, and you can see from the graph there, um, from our 60s to 80s, very much increasing, and our all our other pop age populations decreasing significantly. So it would actually mean that we would be shrinking in, in terms of in terms of development. So there are pros to this option. I mean, there's a limited impact on Monmouthshire's biodiversity and landscape, and there's a limited impact on climate change, but there's no new growth. This is a huge um, con for us. It means Monmouthshire would not require any new housing development. It will fail to deliver any affordable housing, and there'd be so no new market housing supplies. So it'd be very, very restrictive in terms of, in terms of Monmouthshire's growth ambitions. This is the second option, um, 
which we brought in consultation for. So this is the, the Welsh Government's 2018 principal projection. It's the starting point for adding any policy choices um, on, onto this growth option. So it's a demographic-led projection, which replicates the Welsh Government's 2018 uh, population scenario with the affordable housing element added on. So again, on the, on the left graph, you can see we still have an ageing graphic. Um, there's still a reduction um, in that younger age group, particularly the 25s to 35s, there's a reduction there, and also in the 45 to 59 bracket. Um, on the right hand side there, you can see the population change that would be expected. So 6,000 people would be the, the, the um, population change. Jobs, 3,120. Homes, new homes would be 2,865. And then with the 50-50 sites, it would be 3,930. But in terms of new allocations, we wouldn't need to allocate any more land for development with this option. So again, it does give us very limited growth which means that we would not require any new allocations and it's limited um, new affordable housing given with this option because there is sufficient sites within within the existing plan. Um, the pros of this, this option, even though it doesn't give us any growth, there are some pros. Again, it's the impact on, on climate change, the impact on the landscape is very, very limited because there would be no additional growth really. Option three, this is um, the Welsh Government's principal projection with added policy assumptions. So this is a demographic-led projection, which also replicates the Welsh Government's 2018 population scenario as a starting point. However, we add on the increase in the household formation rates and also a reduction in the commuting ratio with, again, the affordable housing added on. Um, as you can see here, again, it doesn't do significant amount in terms of balancing our demography. Um, it does create an, an, a number of home. We wouldn't need a significant amount of new allocations for this option. So 110 homes on new site allocations. So again, we will, we will fail to deliver a meaningful number of affordable homes with this option. Um, and there'd be a continuation of, in it restricting supply of housing and therefore unlikely to keep younger people within the county to live and work. And this option doesn't really give us that retention um, of, of, a, of a younger population. So I think it would potentially fail to give us that sort of sustainable communities, which is what we, we, we keep discussing and what this council's key aim is. In terms of the pros, um, there would be some opportunity to secure some affordable housing in this option, but very, very limited. And there is an over, overall decline in the working age groups, although there is some growth in the 35 to 44 age group. So there is a little bit of growth, but um, I think it's debatable whether that is significant enough. This is option four. So this is a dwelling led um, based on building rates for the past last five years. So this is a continuation of what we've done over the last five years um, and includes also the, the affordable housing again. And this is starting to show a, a bit of a shift. So an increase of population of 10,641 and with jobs of 5,460, and then new homes with the affordable housing, um, about 6,030, 6, so 402 per annum. Um, and on the right there, you can see there is some change now. So there is further growth establishing the working age groups of 30 to 44. There are opportunities to secure some affordable housing and infrastructure improvements for this one, and opportunities to sustain services and facilities. Um, this level of growth is known to be easily achievable based on past experience. I think it's worth saying here that the current plan, the current LDP, seeks to achieve 450 dwellings per year. Um, we have achieved that in, in some years, um, so we do think this is easily achievable. And approximately 1,370 homes on new site allocations with this one. So 1,370 on new allocations for, for this particular option. The cons with, with, with this um, particular option, um, still have a high proportion of older population living in the county. As you can see there on the right on that graph, the risk of a high aging demographic. So it's, it's debatable whether we will deliver balanced, sustainable communities. There's not a meaningful amount of affordable housing from this option and not enough new dwellings to provide a range and choice of homes to address the county's affordability issues. Um, so, so yeah, so, that, so, so it does still have a, a number of challenges with this option as well. 
Option number five. Now, this is the preferred option um, that we that the council is going to be seeking um, to say the best addresses our issues and objectives. So this is a demographic led scenario um, with household formation rates and commuting ratios adjusted. Take into account of the removal of, of the seven bridge tolls over 2015 and 2020 as well. So it's taking into account that inward migration, which the council is see, seeing. So as you can see from the graph on the left, there is much more of a balanced community with this with this option. We do see um, the 30s to 50 year olds increase over the plan period. Um, there is a reduction in the, in the 50 to 59 area. This is um, maybe Peter will come on to talk about this later, but there is this is a national um, situation where there was a, a drop in the birth rate in the 70s, I believe, which has resulted in in this um, reduction really, and that was that's a national picture, not just the Monmouthshire picture. So that's where that reduction is coming. But as you can see from all the other age groups, that, apart from the 20s and 29s, where where people do go off to university and and study, we don't have a university in this county, so we'll be able to track those those people. But as you can see, it's much more of a balanced demography. We've got younger people, younger families, and the age group does seem to be a lot more balanced across the board. This would result in a population increase of 12,433. Approximately, jobs-wise, we would need 7,215 to sustain that. And then homes with the affordable housing added on is 7,605. So homes per annum with the 50-50 added on would be 507. Um, and just as a bit of a comparison, which I will come on to in the moment, in terms of the preferred strategy went out on in March, that was 499. So it is very similar to what we were going out on consultation for previously. Again, I'll, I'll just outline some of the pros and cons with this one, but it does enable more balanced sustainable communities in terms of demographic and um, significant growth in the working age group for this one, fueling growth in the employment provision. And it does secure a significant amount of affordable housing, really addressing that key challenge for the council. Uh, and there are opportunities to secure infrastructure improvements and sustain existing services with this. As you can imagine, the pressure uh, on, on um, particularly the healthcare with an ageing population is going to be significant. So that balanced dem demography, and what we've all noticed from in the pandemic is, is communities working together, all age groups pulling together to ensure um, sustainable, resilient communities. In terms of the cons for this for this particular option, um, it does increase pressure on monitors infrastructure as well. And um, so schools, healthcare, et cetera. And we, and we certainly need to work on an infrastructure plan to go along this level of growth. And, and, that, and that's a key piece of work which goes alongside the LDP. So we will be keen to look at that. Um, it's obviously going to have an impact on the, on the natural environment. And there's challenges in reducing climate change impact, but opportunities to ensure we do design sustainable carbon neutral development as well. So it's really, really exciting, really, in terms of, in terms of how we move forward. And the last option um, we're going up to consultation for, um, hopefully subject to cabinet agreeing this next week, is, an, is a high end radical structural change with commuting ratio adjusted. So this is an employment led projection um, and this particular scenario uplifts Monmouthshire's past economic growth rate in line with Monmouthshire's ambition to grow economically. And, and again, it has that um, affordable housing element added on to this. As you can see on the left, this does again ensure that we do have um, a balanced uh, demography with increases in all age groups. Um, again, that, that 50 age group, as I said, um, from um, the national picture in terms of birth rates in, in that 50, uh, to 59 cohorts is still low, but that, that is a national picture. But overall, it does show um, a, a balanced demography. It does show a significant amount of population change, so 17,403. Significant amount of jobs again, 9,630, and um, a significant number of homes, 9,060, with, with the affordable housing added on. And that would mean that we would need to create 604 um, per annum to meet that. And as I said, that, that is quite different from, from the 450, which we're currently developing in the existing plan. The significant pros with this one in terms of securing a significant amount of affordable housing, significant amount of infrastructure improvements and you know, opportunities to sustain services. However, there is greater ambiguity around the effects of employment led scenarios due to uncertainty associated with economic forecasts. So there are a number of things at the moment, obviously, with the pandemic, Brexit, which could mean that this economic forecast would, wouldn't be the most appropriate to go with and, and challenges in meeting that level of, of job growth. Um, there is a high level of dwelling growth um, with this scenario as well, which may be achievable. Um, 
However, that is going to have an impact on, on, on the Monmouthshire's infrastructure and the natural environment as well. So just as a bit of a comparison against um, the, diff the different op op options, this graph does show the different comparisons against the different models. And what we've done here with that blue arrow, it does show um, what we pre previously consulted on as, oh, sorry, the green, sorry, is what we previously consulted on it back in March. So March 2020, this is the preferred strategy which you went to consultation out, out on, um, and that showed 499 dwellings per annum. This Blue arrow just shows this projection and our preferred option um, out of these six. Um, as I said, we want to be open and transparent with, with communities and the public um, with regards to how our thoughts are with regards to addressing these issues. So that's just a comparison of the different models and where we were against the preferred strategy elements with that, with that green plan there. I'll just pass you on to my colleague now, Rachel Lewis, who will be able to talk you through different spatial options for this level of growth that we will be consulting on as well. Rachel, if you just want to let me know when um, you want me to put the slide on, I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. Um, so we're currently, we're proposing to go out on four spatial options for the command statutory consultation. Um, members may recall that last time we consulted on six spatial options, two of which included a new settlement option. Um, but we've since been advised by Welsh Government officials that the inclusion of a new settlement would be contrary to national planning policy. So we haven't taken those forward this time. So the first one is the continuation of the existing LDP strategy, uh, which looks to distribute growth around the county with a particular focus on the main towns. Um, and there would also be opportunities for mixed use um, developments as in the current LDP. Um, the maps here are just indicative to show you, you know, roughly where growth would, give, growth would go. They're not specific and they're not accurate to this stage. The next one, please, Craig. So option two is to distribute growth proportionately across the county's most sustainable settlements. So growth, so that includes jobs, private, affordable housing, which is to be distributed across the most sustainable settlements. Um, with a level of growth proportionate to the size of the settlement and the amenities. Um, affordable housing need would be based on the need identified in the LHMA. And we would also look at the capacity for growth and the need for the development um, to sustain communities in, the, in those areas. This is our preferred option. As Craig said, we identified our preferred options at this stage. We think that this option would best address the county's issues and challenges and meet the plan's objectives, including the provision of market and affordable housing across the county's most sustainable settlements. It would also enable sustainable economic growth and support balanced and socially sustainable communities. As Craig says, the importance of which has been heightened by the current pandemic. So that one is our preferred option at this stage. Next slide, please, Craig. So the third option is to focus growth in the south of the county along the M4 corridor um, to capitalise on strategic transport links to the Cardiff capital region and um, towards England, and also looking at existing economic opportunities and the infrastructure connections. Affordable housing would be directed to the sustainable settlements in the south of the county identified in the local housing market assessment as having greatest need. And the map just shows there that all growth would be focused in the south. Next one, please, Craig. So the fourth vital option is to focus growth in the north of the county, again, on the most sustainable settlements within the north to capitalise on transport links to the heads of the valleys and the wider Cardiff capital region and northwards towards Herefordshire. As with option three, affordable housing would be directed to those most sustainable settlements identified as having the greatest need in the LHMA. So, the, that's just a quick snapshot of the four spatial options we're consulting on. Um, there's more detail in the easy read guide that members should have um, received um, yesterday or today. So just to sum up the preferred growth options, um, options, growth option five is our preferred growth option, um, which generates around 7,500 new homes and 7,255 new jobs. That's 30% that Craig's um, touched on. And our preferred spatial option is spatial option two, which is proportionate growth across the county's most sustainable settlements for the reasons I've just discussed. The last slide just sets out our next steps. 
Um, Anything else to add, Mark? Uh, No, I don't think so. Thanks, Chair. Happy to look at questions. Yeah, uh, Bob, have you any comments before we go into questions? No, I'm fine. Thanks, Chair. OK, right, members, any questions? Um, can we uh, put their hands up or raise their hands and then I can I can bring you in whenever I've got Martin to start with Martin. Um. Thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thank you very much for a uh, detailed report uh, and, and for the seminar that you ran for us the other evening, both uh, very useful and interesting. Um, I'd like to make some comments around growth option five, your, your preferred uh, option there, uh, and particularly on, on two of the areas of concern, your cons there. Uh, the first comment is around the comment that um, this option, uh, there are challenges in re in reducing climate change. Um, this council has declared a climate emergency, uh, and it seems to me that um, a response that says there will be opportunities to design carbon neutral development is a bit of a, a bit, bit of a limp response to an emergency. Uh, and, and I would plead that if this does become our preferred option, um, then this becomes a central consideration and it goes no further until there are very clear ways uh, in which um, uh, uh, carbon reduction can be addressed. Um, I would say that uh, central to this has to be a reduction in outward commuting from uh, Monmouthshire towns, um, increasing local employment opportunities to support the need to for, for a reduced commuting, uh, and thirdly, an increased focus on the development of local food production and in what is uh, often uh, quite an agricultural part of the county to acknowledge that as we move forward into the future, that might well mean less of a focus on livestock farming and more on uh, uh, addressing non-meat food production uh, in line with requirements of local people. Um, the second con that, that I would comment on uh, growth option five uh, is the increased pressure on the nat natural environment. And, and this links in with the spatial options. Uh, I, I'm glad that it is suggested that we go to move away from the current LDP. Uh, and I think that on what I've seen this morning, I, I would support the idea that we, we look to spread around the county evenly. Because um, taking my own ward and my own town uh, of Abergavenny and perhaps add plant voice to that, we're surrounded on three sides by a national park. And I remember uh, at the county council, probably about two years now, uh, I, I asked and Bob Greenland answered uh, a question on the possibility of bringing in the idea of a green wedge to separate Mon uh, 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 North Abergavenny from the national park, which I acknowledge is a completely separate planning authority in its own right. Um, and I uh, and I suggested that because my ward runs right up to the national park. Um, and, uh, and I received a reasonably positive response from Councillor Greenland. But then subsequently in the national parks uh, initial uh, publications around their local development plan, um, there was um, a, a, a proposed development of 150 houses by Monmouthshire Housing Association actually inside the National Park. Now, we're talking about protecting the natural environment, and I believe that in planning legislation that is acknowledged. Uh, and, and so as we move forward, I will continue to press the idea of a green wedge and the idea that the natural environment of the Brecon Beacons National Park around the north of Monmouthshire is an, is an environment 
that must be protected. Uh, and so I think there are other alternatives that we've heard this morning that might well allow that to happen, while at the same time supporting climate reduction. But rest assured, officers um, and Councillor Greenland, that as we go forward, uh, I will continue to try to push for these because I think they're essential for making a decent community in the part of the county where I live. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Louise? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I would also like to um, uh, support uh, Councillor Grucott's uh, comments with regard to concern about um, uh, climate change and infrastructure, because option five is the one that has the most challenges there. And the, we have at the moment little infrastructure to support housing. And although I'm sure the response will come back to say that we've got an infrastructure plan, realistically, um, these things, I mean, even in the air quality assessment that was done in Monmouthshire, it said a bypass for Chepstow would take at least 10 years. And um, I think, you know, there are bypasses that take like 79 years or something. And I don't think we're going to get this in infrastructure change. Um, also, obviously, the air quality is a concern because I noticed that on the television this morning, it was saying that Bristol uh, air quality levels have returned already to pre-COVID levels and the commuting has also increased to that particular level and we're very much affected by this in the um, southern area of um, Monmouthshire. So I do have concerns about that. Uh, looking at the things on air quality and so forth, I don't really think, um, you know, adding extra um, charging points on, on sites will um, assist because A, electric cars are too expensive for most people at the moment to buy and um, B, it'll just increase the traffic congestion in any event. And um, looking at that, I think um, at the moment Monmouthshire can't um, really cope with, with um, extra development. I mean, along the sites that have already being planned because th there is a difficulty here in 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 actually accommodating them because of infrastructure concerns which i can't see being solved in the possibly the long-term basis perhaps for the next plan but certainly not in the short-term basis i i can't see that happening i think what will happen as um i think one of the other councillors said uh, yesterday was that um uh, effectively it'll mean our uh, commuting rate will increase. Now this comes down to the um, spatial options as well because if the um, if um, housing is, is uh, distributed evenly around the areas then you'll get um, areas like Raglan for example um, adding on to the um, climate change problem by um, commuting from there to Bristol or to Cardiff or, or to Newport. So I don't think that necessarily solves it. I would question some of the information that we've got on the uh, demographics because, um, you know, it says, I don't know what account has been taken of existing properties because in the age range 30 to um, uh, 59, who are working population, they're more likely to be able to purchase the existing properties when they come up for sale because the uh, local housing, um, the LHMA said that we had more detached properties than we did, you know, the larger properties which have already been built. So I don't think there's probably any account taken of that. The other issue that um, I would like to raise is on the demographic side because Basically, if you look at the demographics of every other area, um, the population is ageing anyway. And, um, you know, obviously there's going to be a high proportion of um, over 50s in every location in the UK. And if you look at the demographic statistics, it also shows that there's the only area that you do have the um, attracts the younger population is the city areas because of the jobs. So I don't think 
Um, a lot of the arguments that were put forward in this plan um, were also put forward in the last LDP about um, young people and um, you know demographics and so forth and it still really hasn't made any difference. I don't think building more houses necessarily um, does that because it's a demographic issue as opposed to anything else. Looking at the spatial um, options on the um, option one which was basically the current option option one actually <clears throat> is more in line that we had on the on the existing ldp is actually more in line with the draft national <clears throat> development framework which actually argues for um, town centers first in terms of development looking at the um, other option on the northern um, side which is the last option which i think councillor Grucott was arguing against. I mean, the advantage of that is there has been a lot of infrastructure development in that particular area. And um, also, um, it is, we've had a report today about where the housing need for affordable housing is, and it's supposed to be in that particular area as well. You know, so I think um, that that option also has to be considered because it does actually say on the slide presentation, um, for that spatial option, that's where the um, need is based. So I think, um, you know, I obviously I appreciate that there'll be opportunities, to, there'll be um, uh, efforts to improve um, internal job opportunities, but I think it's more likely to increase uh, commuting, which is actually against the um, uh, PPW edition 10, which is about having um, uh, jobs where um, housing is and and you know we're not in a growth area um, it's the Newport and Valleys area according to the National Development Framework so I don't think that what we're putting forward addresses the climate issue or it address, addresses um, the, the national policies either. Thank you. Okay thanks Louise. Uh, Craig or, or uh, Rachel, have you any answers to that as reference to not addressing the climate issues from uh, Councillor Brown? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Happy to um, assist in terms of answers for us on this. Um, climate change, obviously, is a, is a huge issue which is affecting us all, but obviously that needs to be balanced against the housing crisis as well. Um, I think we've just been through a, a number of bits of data in terms of the LHMA and the fact that people need homes and I think what what we're saying as officers is that, is that through this local development plan we'll be able to build the most sustainable homes that have ever been built so we'll have sustainable drainage and have renewable energy be the most energy efficient homes these homes will be better than any homes that have been built previously because of the regulations have been obviously improved to, to address this um address the climate change and mitigation so we are ensuring that we you know, we're providing homes for people, which is a fundamental right, in my opinion, in terms of having a home over your over your over your head and, and shelter. Um, and, and we all know, I mean, in terms of the homeless crisis and, and the impact of the pandemic with people, you know, it, it is a, is a key is a key consideration of this council to, to provide those, those those houses. And in Monmouthshire, we're very we're very land. We've got a huge amount of land, um, and we don't have much development. So I think the percentage of land which is actually built on is very very small. Um, we are very, very, so we've got a lot of land to use and it's a key resource that we can use to provide these homes and these developments and this level of growth for our population, um, which I think is really, really key to this discussion. Um, in terms of in terms of the climate change, we certainly will be addressing that via our green infrastructure policies. We're looking to introduce renewable energies on homes. We're looking to introduce um, solar parks and enabling policies to ensure these things can happen. So I do think if we are going to address all of these things, which is climate change plus the housing emergency and the crisis, then I think we, you know, it's, a, it's a balanced approach. It's all of these things in, in the realm. Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate to, to not um, have any level of growth and, and not address these issues. I mean, we've had a, a lot of members have had this discussion today about, um, you know, needing to provide these affordable mm -hmm. units. Um, also, with regards to working from home, um, the Welsh yeah. Government's policy is that 
um, by 2025, I think it was 2030, that we have 30% of people working from home. So that is a target from the Welsh Government, and that's what we will seek to address as well. And I think for working through the pandemic, it's quite clear that, that that can happen, that we can do that. I think companies are going to be having different business models now. They are going to have more of their employees working from home, um, and that's what we'll seek to address as well. And maybe look at our town centres, where we can have working office hubs where people can live and work more locally and have and, and reduce that level of commuting and we certainly will be ensuring that going forward um, and also the active travel policies and, and linking into the metro as well so we certainly are seeking to address that transport piece as well um i think there was some other elements in terms of the green wedge as well so i have just sort of writing down some of the questions that council real quick that raised but we will certainly be doing a green reg review and we'll be working with our colleagues in the southeast wales region to, to get a methodology together for that um, and we will we'll, they're not addressing that across the county as to whether we need green wedges in certain areas and um, so that is certainly a piece of work that will be going alongside the ldp and, and, and the ldp is it's such a, a long um detailed piece of work this growth and spatial option is the starting point and on that then there'll be all these climate change policies um the green wedge policy all of these elements will be looked at and, and protecting the landscape is, is a key part of that whilst delivering all of the, all of the objectives. And Councillor Brown did touch upon the infrastructure. Yes, officers are, I know members and officers are all concerned about existing infrastructure, but I think this growth will enable some of those services to be sustained in the long term as well. So we will be able to get financial contributions to sustain some of these services um, going forward. And if we have an ageing population, that's going to put more demand on our services. And this plan, as I keep saying, is a starting point. There will be an infrastructure plan alongside this, which will look um, to how we sustain that level of growth and also a transport plan as well, a local transport plan, which will be able to ensure that we have the right sort of infrastructure in place for this level of growth. In terms of um, affordable housing, I think Councillor Brown was touching on where the affordable housing is needed most. Well, affordable housing is needed across the county. It's not just in one specific area. The LHMA has indicated that we need this level of housing across the area, and, and it is key to address those key issues and objectives. And, the, and in regards to the, the NDF, the, yeah, the, this plan is certainly going to need to be in conformity with the NDF, that the NDF, the Future Wales document, is, is the top level in terms of the planning policy. So, this replacement plan will certainly need to comply and, and address those issues and i can see a reason why option five wouldn't comply with um the ndf in terms of its aspirations to deliver affordable housing and to ensure we have place making and sustainable communities and that's key to monmouthshire in terms of delivering these resilient communities so i think i've tried to cover everything and there's a lot of questions and queries covered in but if there's anything else please come back members and i'm happy to give give opinions on that thanks for that great i've got uh, councillor edwards uh, ruth Thank you very much indeed. It's been rather a long meeting and I shall have to go in a minute, but I thought I'd better just put a spoke in the wheel, so to speak. Um, Craig mentioned there we have got a lot of land. Not all land is suitable for production of, of housing and so on. And there again, it is not all suitable for food production. I'm a food producer myself in Monmouthshire of of meat and specifically dairy we are we will always need that and you can't produce those on all sorts of land so and we do look after the countryside and that is also why in Monmouthshire we um we tend to have a lot of people come to retire in Monmouthshire so that's why which exacerbates our um, older age group as well um and that's why I'm always saying we need more bungalows but I think we it's no good having um all the housing, all your lights on, and we don't have anything to eat. But and with now with the um, Brexit, nobody's mentioned it. We still don't know which way that's going. But we most probably will not be able to uh, import at a price that we have been used to. Like you know, things are going to get more expensive. Um, it was on the news this morning about that. It could up, go up five percent. But then, if your weekly average bill is a hundred pound, that's only five pound extra. Which put it into context. Perhaps it needs somebody not having a packet of fags or a pint of beer in a week. But we are a, a, quite a livestock county, which is well recognised due to the, the type of land that we've got. And you cannot just put housing just because there's a green field there and it doesn't always suit 
as we know around Monmouth, we've got very good agricultural land and some of that has already gone into housing. And it's no good saying we want all the housing in a certain place. And Councillor Brown said of people commuting from Raglan, etc. But they're going to have to commute somewhere because the jobs aren't necessarily in that location. So there's quite an awful lot to consider when you think about where you're going to to build for the future. So I'm. thank you for listening to me, but I'm afraid I shall have to go. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Ruth. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just on a couple of those points, if I could come back as well. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the land take, you know what Councillor Edwards has said and, and, and others is, is completely right. You know, we're not looking to build everywhere um, and it wouldn't be right to do so. We've got some of the best and most versatile agricultural land uh, in Wales, um, some really pristine landscapes, um, not just the designated ones like the Y Valley OMB and the, the corner of the National Park, but also um, you know, some really special other landscapes. So, and, and you know, they, they attract tourists. So we've got to balance um, growth with meeting our demographic needs, our affordable housing needs, the infrastructure challenges that have been mentioned, um, the climate emergency, you know, this this really is a, a bit of a wicked problem in that sense. In terms of level of growth, though, just to give you a bit of reassurance, um, the county is 88,000 hectares, um, including the, the bit that's in the National Park. Um, currently, statistics that were put out um, in 2018, I think they were, by a, a European body that, that looks at what land is used for. Um, the proportion of Monmouthshire that is defined as um, urban built is 3%. Um, so factoring in what we believe we need in terms of new land for housing and new land for employment, um, we'd go from about 3% to less than 3.5% of the county being built on. Um, in one of the consultation exercises we started, we had a plan um, of the entire county showing all of the candidate sites that have been put forward for development, um, which is probably about three times as much as we'd need. And, uh, you know, people were complaining they couldn't actually see the sites we were talking about because they were too small, um, which ironically kind of illustrated the point um, that at a, at a county scale it is it is very small proportion. Um, doesn't mean it's not important to the immediately affected communities because it is and doesn't mean that the infrastructure challenges aren't there um, because they are. Um, but just to give it a bit of a bit of context, really. So, yeah, we absolutely don't need every square inch of the county or, or anywhere near. Um, and we've got to pick the, the best spots um, in terms of where the growth goes. Um, there was a bit of discussion around, um, you know, growth being spread around what we're proposing is proportionate growth so in effect uh, at the moment the larger the settlement the more amenities it has the more uh, transport infrastructure opportunities it has those areas would have a greater proportion of growth um, but we wouldn't want to say no growth in some of the, uh, the larger villages because they do need that affordable housing um, and that support so it's trying to get that balance right um, but it would be broadly proportionate with how big they are now um, because that links with what their amenities are now. Uh, so it is, it is a, it is a really difficult problem. I understand, um, you know, the way it's going to vex us all over the next few years trying to get it right. And then I understand the very local pressures that ward members will be under um, to look at things within their ward. Um, but we have got to take a step back at a strategic level now um, and look at what level of growth um, and how it's distributed is right in a broad sense. Um, and, you know, this is your plan as members. It's not my plan. It's not planning policy team's plan um, as officers. It's, it's your plan. If you want to select a different level of growth than you can, um, we're just trying to present you the implications of that. And I think those demographic graphs and the affordable housing data we heard earlier paints a really stark picture. Um, and it fills me with a bit of dread to go for one of those lower options. Uh, absolutely right in what was said that the older population will, will grow anyway. Um, you know, it's not something we're trying to curtail. It's just making sure we have that balance. Um, in the workshop, um, we had some discussion around, you know, school roles falling in some places and uh, the benefits of bringing in some some families and younger children, uh, which does mean inward migration into the county. And if a lot of that can be, um, you know, supported in the right locations and those people can work from home or work locally, then we don't have those commuting challenges. Um, so yeah, there's loads of different objectives to try and align, loads of different pressures on us, 
um, but that's that's why our recommendation what it is in terms of making a, a meaningful dent on those those key objectives and issues that we've already uh, agreed need to be addressed thanks okay. chair thanks mark I, can i just oh sorry chair sorry yeah yeah yep. really briefly could i mention councillor grocott was talking about um the way in which our land is used for agriculture um i don't disagree with with the comments that were made in terms of livestock versus crops etc um but in planning policy terms that isn't something we'd have policies around agriculture as agriculture um broadly very broadly outside of the planning system you know as a deliberate intent for us not to interfere in the business um so things like intensive poultry units they would need consent and would possibly be of concern but otherwise you know whether somebody has cows versus corn um is nothing within within the planning uh, the ldp's control or, or remit um what is within the remit is thinking about um things like community allotments um or growing spaces so um, there's a chance for people to put forward land for those uses um so on a very small kind of community level um what councillor Gralcott was talking about is is relevant um to the plan but you know the bigger picture whether people have cows or corn um isn't isn't in our remit okay I, I, was that councillor edwards i think wasn't it uh, or on about the farm side of it and or was it oh up? sorry could be yeah okay no problem can i just say a few comments before i bring louise in which i i, I just i i live in the uh live in the national parks or i in the national parks and i know in the last last delivery of, the, of their ldp um, we seem to get uh, a big big lump of their delivery over to, to, to the Monmouthshire side um, and reference to probably one of the third largest settlements, maybe the second from Brecon. Um, and I understand I, I, I do get all the infrastructure and, and members uh, put in perspective. Um, we've just had a new um, road put through um, through Monmouthshire, um, up through up through the, the valley there. And, and we could be talking close on probably well over half a billion pounds to construct that road and, and it's made the point that uh, the next section is going to cost over a billion pound when we put that in perspective of delivering affordable homes how many affordable homes can we deliver so infrastructure is so important on, on on the basis of delivering homes and delivering infrastructure it's so expensive to deliver infrastructure to deliver when you're delivering homes so you buy a piece of land for five million and build five million that's 10 million quid but when you need to put infrastructure in it's so expensive when you need to put proper infrastructure in and when you take that in perspective of delivering 200 affordable homes or 500 affordable homes it's nothing but not having the infrastructure in place is so important but to deliver that is so expensive i did say in the last ldp Perhaps we should create a new settlement in Monmouthshire, one new settlement, a new ward, whatever you want to call it. I know it won't go down, but it would answer a lot of our problems within Monmouthshire about delivering everything that we need to deliver. Do you deliver that new ward near, um, uh, near, near, near the networks so it's got good uh, economic benefits or you know you would never create a a new a new settlement where there's no infrastructure but to put the infrastructure going back to my last comment it's so expensive you're talking a billion pound to put infrastructures in now for for, for these areas it's, it, it's massive amount of money and it's money that we just don't have so to deliver something that people want us to deliver we need to have the other things with it delivering new schools I mean, we know it's not cheap. You know, I mean, we've sat through the meetings, 50, 60 million pound to build a school for, for to, to deliver some of these things. Doctor surgeries, uh, do they have a future? You know, I mean, the last nine months is telling us some things don't even have a future in, in, in the next couple of decades. Um, leisure centres, do we support our leisure centres? Because we're going to, we're going to create these communities which are going to be larger we have to we have to address the well-being and all these things as well and it, it's so important and yeah i mean my personal view is i i think we need to really consider do we create a new hub within monmouthshire to deliver because we seem to go around in circles in putting so many here so many there and then we have we have all the other things to go with it uh i mean it's important we have to we have to think about that that's just my comments and I, I live in the national parks and I, I know how, how hard it is and how difficult it is to to have that green wedge also because 
um, we all we all want to have that aspiration of, of where we come from is is we want the best for that area but as a corporate appointee which I am to Monmouthshire I want the best for Monmouthshire as well and whether it's on my doorstep or on Chepstow's doorstep Monmouth or Abergavenny for me it's important that for my children and for the children of Monmouthshire that we we deliver and at the moment we find it so difficult to do that so the next 10 20 years we're going to make that decision in the near future and, and that's the important thing for me so i've got louise and then bob wants to come back in and any members then please put your hands up now because we are running on time and you can have your say i've got david as well right louise and then bob and then david thank you yes thank you thank you chair i think um probably the point that um, um might come back is is that the um uh, Welsh Government has ruled out new settlements. Um, uh, I'm sure that's what the response that will come back. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, 3% of land in Monmouthshire, um, I believe that in terms of housing, it, about 80% or so of that is in the south. I mean, I'm just remembering, trying to remember from figures that we got at the uh, Economic and Economic and Development Select Committee, but I think that was the case. And if you're in an area where there's sort of um, it's basically urban sprawl, it won't really make any difference about how many percentage of um, land there isn't developed elsewhere. If you're in a very high um, urban area and um, you know the towns and villages are emerging, I think it's very important to have uh, green wedges um, between. Uh, towns and villages and between villages and villages to maintain their identity and I think that is what what is missing from uh, the LDP and I think that needs to be included. The other concern is obviously you know I mentioned about air quality and air quality and climate change don't seem to be su a sufficient uh, priority in the documents that I've seen you know for example I think Oxford uh, City has got a a zero tolerance of um, uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide in, in the atmosphere and Chepstow's got a worse um, air quality uh, than Bristol has and Bristol seem to be doing something about it. But I mean, I think that has to be a consideration in terms of um, housing development as well because of the added pressure of the tolls going, which is attracting uh, people um, to to live from Bristol and therefore uh, commute commute into Bristol for the jobs that they've already got. So I think all of these things need to be concerned and, you know, a higher priority and ranking in terms of, um, you know, how you score these things um, need, needs to be attributed to that. But uh, thank you for your time anyway. You're on mute, Chair. Would anybody like to just answer any questions from previous before I bring Bob in? Um, Ray, yeah, can I just comment really Bob? briefly, Chair, in terms of um, a new settlement, so something that, that both yourself and Councillor Brown uh, mentioned. Um, personally, I I would agree with you in terms of that being a, a potentially really important long term uh, option for the county. Unfortunately, the reason why it's not considered now is the Welsh Government has said we can't do a, a new settlement via our individual LDP. Um, so it has been uh, dismissed at this stage from our consideration, but it hasn't been rejected as an idea full stop. Um, it would just be a, a longer term option um, that will come via the Strategic Development Plan for South East Wales. I say would, could come via the um, South East Wales Strategic Development Plan. Um, realistically, that will probably be adopted um, 2026 at the earliest now. Um, so really we're talking about the next LDP after this. Um, I certainly wouldn't discount it as a, as a longer term option. I think it's got an awful lot of merit personally, um, certainly to be investigated further in, in proper detail. But for now, for this plan, um, we couldn't do it. In terms of the priorities, I know we talked an awful lot today about um, affordable housing and demography. Um, but the other objectives, the climate emergency, air quality, infrastructure, they're all there detailed in the in the lengthy report that sits behind this, um, are all very important. So please don't think that we've uh, weighted them in any way, um, favourably or unfavourably. Uh, they are all important and we have given them consideration. 
Um, but I think there are aspects that can address growth and some of those issues. So, for example, I know Councillor Brown mentioned about e-charging for cars not really making a difference. I'd, I'd have to disagree. Um, you know, by 2030, potentially, uh, definitely 2040, new sales of diesel and petrol cars you know, won't be happening. They will be phased out as the technology develops. They will become cheaper and, and people will move to that. Um, there's a lot of work going on in terms of public transport investment and infrastructure improvements. You know, we've just seen the Burns report recently um, and other work in that area. So that combined with the home working and the way in which that's changing. Um, and again, mention I've made earlier about younger people wanting to live in the cities. I think the evidence is coming out that that's changing too. People are looking more at quality of life and environment um, than commuting times because some people in some jobs can work from home and will do going forwards. Um, Anyway, there's other hands there and, and time's going on, so I'll be quiet now. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Bob? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, officers have answered uh, pretty well all the things that I noted down, and I, so I don't want to go over those again. But I do want to take the opportunity of thanking officers for the reports and from the presentations today and the huge amount of work that is going on behind the scenes to get us to this stage. Um, I thought that presentation was very clear and those graphs that showed the options, the six options, really, for me, highlighted it. But just to say, we've got two crises here. We've got the crisis of climate emergency and we've got the crisis of housing, particularly social housing and affordable housing. And those two are not compatible. They, you know, you, they're fighting against each other and we can't ignore either of them. As far as climate emergency is concerned, uh, last week we had the Burns report and the Burns report in rejecting uh, well, actually, it didn't reject the M4, but it accepts that that's not going to go for, uh, forward, the M4 relief road. But it does say about the um, importance of further public transport. And we now need to fight for further public transport of commuter style frequency into all parts of Monmouthshire. Because by doing that, that is an important fight as far as we're concerned in, uh, for climate emergency. And if we can get into some of our smaller settlements, really good public transport, commuter um, frequency in places like Raglan, that has been mentioned previously, that will help us enormously. Um, but looking at the issue of um, houses, houses you cannot separate from jobs. And we, in, in this LDP, we also must be providing opportunities for new jobs in the locality. But it's absolutely true to say that we can now quite clearly see that an awful lot more people will be working from home than we might have envisaged um, a few years ago. Infrastructure, you look, that is, it is so important. But it is also equally important to recognise that we don't have the um, the ability to provide that infrastructure first and then build the housing. So we've got to do as best we can as we move forward. The other issue that we've got to face is the fact that if we do nothing and have a low growth um, in terms of, uh, of, of housing and we don't change the demographics, that has a huge financial burden on the council because our requirement for social services will go up and up and the numbers of people to spread that cost will go down and down. And that is not a sustainable future financially. And frankly, neither is it a county that I want to live in where it is regarded as the last step before the grave. We must have a more balanced society. We must do as a healthy society. So we must provide these jobs and these opportunities and these houses uh, for younger people. And I think that the option of five, as we've shown, and indeed the, um, the spatial option of two, where we look at sustainable uh, settlements that we have and putting housing there right across the county is the right thing. And I've listened to everybody this morning, uh, and I think that the proposals that are going to Cabinet are the right proposals moving forward. Um, and I take on board everything that members 
have to say, and I recognize particularly when I listen to um, to Louise, how much they will inevitably be defending their local areas. That is that is the job of local um, members. <laughs> but it is the job as the council as a whole to listen to everybody and to come up to, with the right policy for the county as a whole. And I think we've got them in the options that this report is, is taking forward. But um, there's a long way to go. Uh, and I do thank members for what has been a very long meeting. Um, and there will be many more to come. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bob. I've got David and then Val, and then we will round up. I've got no more hands up. Uh, David or oh, Roger? Val, uh, David, Dovey? Do you want a quick one off me, Chairman? Yeah, I don't know where David is. Yes, Val, yeah, fire away. Yeah. Very, very quickly, I thank officers and everybody who's put work into this, and I find these meetings most useful, and I find the technology fantastic at the moment, so that is fine. <laughs> Um, Councillor Greenland talking about defending local areas. I don't think I'm uh, running true to form because I had this yearning. Well, initially, yes, I still feel that it would have been good to see a new settlement, but could have been sort of working in conjunction with Torfine, who have probably got a considerable development coming on, as I say, quite close to my area. Um, you've got access then to station roads, whatever, because part of the inf infrastructure we really need to look at you're going to have a rollicking run down the A40, 4042 from Abergavenny to the new hospital if you're in emergency on that route that we've got. So thank you very much indeed. Um, the electric cars sound wonderful, don't they? I'm waiting for the one I can get into, press a button that says wherever I'm going and I go. But I read a report which regrettably shows that some research that's been done recently, there is more pollution from the tyres, more detriment to the climate and from fragments that wear off tires so on a happy note sincere thanks to everybody and um i look forward to the next edition thank you chairman thank, thank you, you Matt. thank you i've got nobody else uh sigmund to come back in bob are you, are you hang on i've got roger roger you got your hand up roger thanks uh chair uh, it's been a, a an excellent meeting i think there's absolutely no doubt about it but it's thrown up um, uh, a massive dilemma for all of us uh, uh, county uh, councillors. And basically, I'm going to accuse us all of being corporate NIMBYs because we want all the good things, but as long as they're not in our uh, area, uh, and that's just like everything that comes before the, uh, uh, the planning committee. And I can illustrate uh, um, uh, one dichotomy, it's all already been mentioned uh, near where I live and where uh, Martin uh, lives, which is the uh, proposal for Monmouthshire housing to build up to 150 houses um, in, the, um, in the National Park. Now, we're talking about 150 social houses that we are prepared to uh, say no because of um, it's in the national park. We shouldn't uh, we shouldn't have that. So therefore, 150 families uh, can go elsewhere or, or or nowhere. So we have that dilemma, and it's all over the uh, the county. And we must never forget that because if we're turning something down. We're pushing it uh, somewhere else where somebody else is going to say, I don't want that. So let's just keep that in mind um, when we actually uh, help formulate the, uh, uh, the plan. But as I say, so far, absolutely excellent uh, meeting. And thanks, Simon, for, uh, uh, for chairing it. Thank you, Roger. Right. Uh, I've got David back up again. David, are you, are you on? Can you hear me? Okay, yes, I can hear you, David. Yep. Good God. Hi, Simon. I thought I was being ostracized or something. No, anyway, no. It, uh, what I want to say is uh, relatively short now, bearing in mind the number of points that have been made by my colleagues. But the, the, the one thing that really does worry me to a large degree is the fact that in our neck of the woods, um, um, we have this 
this uh, a county called Gloucester that lives just uh, Gloucestershire that lives just um, across the bridge, and their plans for Lydney and the big larger area there are are really considerable, um, and they are recognised as well by the uh, uh, the uh, uh, local uh, local. Uh, uh, sorry, the ca county government <coughs> for uh, um, for what needs to be required for this whole area uh, that uh, covers uh, rail uh, and roads, etc. And I I think we don't take enough notice of that because there is a a, a, a large influx of people that is seeking to come across from Bristol to this area of the wood, and they don't differentiate between Monmouthshire, i.e. Chepstow, and uh, Gloucestershire, i.e. Lydney. It's that place across the river. And we really need to be aware of the impact that that is going to go, give um, to us in the future. Yeah, I just want, uh, uh, that's the main thing I, I'd like to say as far as uh, the highways and people, houses and traveling is concerned. There is one thing, uh, other, um, some couple of years ago, I used to witter on about hydrogen being the fuel for the future. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the fact that uh, Monmouthshire has, uh, a vehicle in production and uh, looking to move to uh, uh, larger vehicles um, uh, uh, to come on stream. And that is going to be a real, a real game changer as far as commercials, I think, um, in, in cutting down pollution, pollution, commercials like our waste coverage, all those sort of areas, we can make a very positive, um, very positive uh, contribution to solving our, our, our own problems. But I, I, the big thing for me is, can we keep our eyes open and look what is happening with other people? To, because they are going to have an impact on us. And we should be fat, fear, I'm sorry, I'm a bit croaky this way. We should be making our policies fit not only what happens to us in in the house, if you like. We need to be sure that our policies meet the impact that other neighbouring counties, and, and it's peculiar really to southern Monmouthshire, like like Bristol and Gloucestershire here have uh, are going to have on our county here as well, but All the right. rest of it I thought was a great a great uh, presentation. I, I thought it was excellent. Thank you. It's a bit late. I could have said more. Uh, does anybody like to comment on David's um, uh, comments about uh, cross border? Um, consultation with the uh, let's say the Gloucester side of it um Mark yeah thanks chair um just to just to confirm that we are working with um colleagues cross border and um, the Forester Dean is doing a new I think they call them local development framework still in England um, but the, essentially an LDP um so we're working uh, closely with our colleagues there and Francis and myself recently attended uh, a meeting um, looking at a regional plan that they're doing um, for uh, Bristol and its surroundings. Um, some of you may be aware they were doing a joint spatial plan that virtually got to the end but got kicked out by uh, by an inspector and they're starting again. Um, so we've been uh, working with them and feeding into that as well. Um, also trying to do a lot of other work on other fronts or around transport um, and, uh, and infrastructure as well um, to, to try and knit it all together, um, you know, not least by uh, the strategic transport group that, that Councillor Dovey attends and, and until recently was chairing. Um, so we, we are trying to uh, knit it all together as best as we can. All right. Thank you, Mark. 
Um, I've got Louise signaling to come back in. I've got no other members signaling. I'll take Louise as the last yeah, one. Yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, I, I think I've made a, a comment in the chat bar uh, as well. I'm, I'm concerned about the comments about um, dismissing important comments for for this uh, local area and defending the local area because it's part and parcel of the unique pressures that our area is under as a result of the tolls going and there's no two ways about what difference that will make to the area not only in terms of um, you know developments that are already ongoing in Fairfield maybe but also the thousands of houses that are being built between Lydney and Chepstow which also adds um, pressure in terms of congestion to the area and also there's a very large campaign group that's been set up in terms of um, transition Chepstow because of the because of these all of these pressures going on locally and um, uh, Mark and I believe has attended some of these meetings so I'm not speaking just from a ward capacity I'm speaking from the pressures that are under our, our, our particular area and I'm concerned that those pressures aren't being recognised by uh, cabinet members. Thank you. Okay thanks for that Louise. Um, I've taken Louise as the last um, member to um, speak there. David, you've still got your, uh, your hand up. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask officers, is there anything else you'd just like to contribute now before I sum up and then we can uh, move on? Anything else, Mark or Craig? Yeah, sorry, I've got two screens and my mouse is on the wrong screen. I couldn't unmute. Um, only really briefly, Chair, if I may. Um, so the recommendation to, um, to your committee or the joint committee is is to, is to scrutinise this and uh, provide comments to cabinet for next week. Um, so as was mentioned yeah. earlier, they need to be, you know, either written or verbally given. We can't include it in the report because that's already had to be published with timescales. Um, consultation runs the fourth of Jan to the first of Feb, um, and uh, we're working on ways of doing that effectively during COVID. Um, we are asking um, cabinet to endorse options five um, growth and option two spatial as our preference um, but you know that is a preference at this stage um, you know we'll be going through the consultation responses and asking cabinet to review that once we've uh, amalgamated those um, it is unusual for us to to give a preference at this stage but our view was we've already gone out publicly on a preferred strategy that we had to stop um, and come back so you know it's already out there the direction of travel we were taking and why um, we think it's better to be open and honest about um, how we're looking at the new evidence and uh, and what our preference is because um, we do have the, the complication almost of those documents being out there in public already and then us going back a step and looking at the evidence afresh. We have come to the same conclusion for the same reasons um, and we just want to be honest with people out there that is is where we um, where we're heading. Um, so that's where we are so far. It is you know a pretty long process as Craig mentioned loads more stages for us to come um, before a select committee in the future um, and work with members via the workshop. So, um, but thanks very much, everyone, for the input this morning. It's been really helpful. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Craig, and thanks to everybody within the team there for all your hard work. As members, now um, we uh, we're going to look at the recommendations there, um, and the um, senior officer there has, has made it very very clear that they're going to go for option five on the growth and option two on spatial. Have we any more comments from members now on, on what we will respond or uh, Aisle and myself uh, will put something together and get it emailed out to you also um, to see what your feelings and your thoughts are. Um, do you support them that option, them two options there of, of five on the growth and two on the spatial? Anybody who has any anything that they'd like to add to that? I've got Roger with his hand up. Um, can I just say to the officers and to the cabinet member, we will, we will have representation at, at the cabinet meeting. Um, uh, Councillor Pavio and myself will be there and Councillor Pavio will be summing up from today's meeting um, for the two agenda items there. So we will be present there in, um, in your meeting. Um, I've got Roger. Roger. Thanks, Chair. Obviously, no ideal uh, option, but I see no reason to uh, support uh, option five and uh, an option two. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Roger. Anybody else? Uh, Louise? 
Yeah, I think um, uh, both myself and, and Councillor Grocott uh, made the comment about concerns about this particular option in terms of um, uh, climate change and air quality and infrastructure. So I think that needs to be um, added and taken account of. Thank you. OK, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Pavia. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's a, it's pro it, it may be a, a question to uh, Hazel as a sort of advisor to the committee. Um, do we need at this stage to make any firm rec recommendations? I mean, obviously, it's the decision of Cabinet uh, to, to make that decision, but we're looking to, I suppose, reflect some of the, 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 the impl implications and, and balance out some of the uh, evidence that have been presented. Um, do we do we formally need to to make that recommendation and 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 choose the options that have been put forward, or can we can we sort of, I suppose, in a way, present um, a, a balanced picture uh, when it comes to the cabinet meeting next week? Because this obviously cabinet is that is, is going to make that ultimate decision. Thanks, Chair. I think, uh, Chair, that it depends whether the committee wishes to make any additional recommendations. Um, from the discussion that I've heard this morning, it seems that the majority of the committee are in broad support with the, the recommendations outlined in the report. Um, obviously, there's been some sort of comments, general comments from members, particularly around climate change, which we can include in the chair's summary. But if there are any additional recommendations that members want to make, now is the time to do so. OK, Hazel, and I, I, I think uh, Paul, going back to, um, to that, I think it does say to feedback and comment and I think Louise and Martin's comments and, and feedback from today's session um, will be very important to put in in the observations from today's meeting. Um, but I, I I believe that everything that has been said, we, we, we have got um, a varied views of, of, of where this is going to go in, in direction. So, yeah, I mean, I do think feedback is so important and then, then that will be up to the cabinet. Uh, Mark, I've got Martin just wants to speak and I've got David. Can I bring you both back in? Uh, uh, Martin to start with and then David. Martin? Ten seconds. I, I'd rather a, a general comment went forward at this point rather than committing ourselves to uh, specific things because I, broadly I agree with much, but uh, if it's not successfully addressing climate change, I couldn't support any any uh, of the ideas okay martin that's a valid point david okay we're struggling with david again there and i'm sure um we'll make contact with david so i, th I think i think um the answer for us then is is is, is a, a joint committee is, is we'll make some uh, feedback and comments on today's meeting is that okay Hazel? and we'll get them out to members if they want to include anything more as long as they do it before uh, paul and myself go to the meeting next wednesday that'd be great am i okay in saying that hazel Yes, that's fine, Chair. We'll we'll do a short summary uh, for each item and uh, we'll make sure that you have that in time to go to Cabinet next week and that members will have sight of it. I'm not sure that there'll be opportunities to kind of uh, change what we draft, but we'll make sure it's an accurate reflection of the discussion held today. Yeah, thank you. David, you're still signalling to come in. Do you, can you hear us? No, we can't. No. OK, members, are you happy with that? If you're not, please, um, please say now because uh, we are going to move on. OK, let's move on to uh, agenda item number. Um, I think it's number eight and nine, which is the um, forward work program from uh, adults and economy. I think we'll take them as a scene. Are you OK with that, Paul? Yeah, just just a couple of additions for 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 the economy and development select chairs uh, forward work program, um, and I, it's something that I raised and, and other um, members of that committee have raised previously. 
in terms of the work that's uh, that needs to be looked at, at which is outstanding. I, I think procurement needs to be added to that list as well as the Cardiff Capital Region City deal as well. Um, and you know there will be elements of of uh, those those areas of work that will be uh, brought probably to the yeah. next uh, the next meeting. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, members of um, economy and development, you're happy with that? Yes. Yep. The chair just made uh, observations there. And as adults, uh, we'll take a scene. But any comments you'd like to make, um, please uh, email myself or Hazel, and we can uh, move that forward. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anything else on today's meeting. All I could say is now um, I just wish um, everybody a, a good, good Christmas and hopefully. We'll see you uh, very soon and stay safe thank you to all the officers and to uh, cabinet members for att today's attendance especially for for um, your input uh, so important and members um speak to you soon um can i stay on board with you hazel now just before uh, you disappear and then um we can um we can just discuss uh, the two items for for paul on um, on wednesday thank you members thank you chair have a good christmas everybody.